Introduction The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have their nests. But where shall the Son of Man find a resting place to lay his head? Even at this very moment he stands at the door of our heart and knocks. A Pharisee once brought him to his home for dinner, but he found his repast in the tears of the harlot. At Jacob's well he quenched his thirst with the repentance of the Samaritan woman. Passing through the streets of Jericho, he granted sight to the blind man who kept calling to him when the crowd urged him to be quiet. It was there that he found the chief publican, Zacchaeus, eagerly watching for him from up in a sycamore tree, and he brought salvation to his house. Now also he searches the midnight tempest, listening intently for the bleating plea of his lost sheep, longing to lift it up and place it on his shoulder and take it to his father. Indeed, he promised that he himself will serve and wait on the servant whom he finds watching. Bishop Ignatius Briancheninov's work on the prayer of Jesus has rightly found a place among the best-known patristic writings of the Orthodox Christian's life in Christ. In it, he relates to us the timeless truths of the Gospels, the teachings of Christ, and the prayerful calling upon his name. It was written in the middle of the last century by a church father, close enough to us both in time and in experience, to give specific attention to many of our contemporary peculiarities. It was in 1827 that the young Dmitri Bryanchininov, due to the devastated state of his physical health, finally obtained his release from what promised to be a brilliant career under the personal patronage of Tsar Nicholas I. The twenty-year-old aspirant to monastic life immediately rushed to join the brotherhood directed by his spiritual father, Elder Leonid, who was later to become the first of the renowned Optina elders. His formative years in monasticism were passed under the direction of Elder Leonid and of some of the other disciples of St. Paisius Velichkovsky, Archimandrite Theophon, and Hieromonk Athanasius. Divine Providence made severe demands on the rare gifts with which the young monk Ignatius was endowed, and he soon found himself spiritual father and abbot of the St. Sergius Hermitage, just outside St. Petersburg, charged by Tsar Nicholas with forming an exemplary monastic community to edify the elite of the imperial Russian capital. The future Bishop Ignatius entered monastic life just as St. Seraphim ended his years of seclusion in the forest of Serov. He died in 1867, the same year as the great luminary of that era, Metropolitan Philaret of Moscow. He was a contemporary of the anonymous author of The Way of a Pilgrim, and of a host of grace-bearing ascetics and spiritual directors, maintaining close contacts with many of them. He lived during a time when the vast lands of Russia and the Orthodox East were green with the fresh shoots of the bountiful spiritual harvest mowed down and threshed out during our own twentieth century. Nonetheless, Bishop Ignatius's writings are the fruit of intense suffering and struggle. He himself had to wrestle with his own aristocratic upbringing and secular education, many features of which proved incompatible with orthodox asceticism. Throughout his entire life, he was constantly associated with the Russian intelligentsia and educated, cultured society. Thus, he was constantly confronting many of the intellectual and religious currents which have since gathered force to pervade the atmosphere today. One of the purposes for which Bishop Ignatius wrote was to counteract misconceptions and expose pitfalls which he himself encountered, both in his own personal spiritual development and in guiding those who were constantly turning to him for spiritual direction. One of these was the notion that the prayer of Jesus is appropriate only for monastics who are well advanced in the spiritual life. Bishop Ignatius refers us to ancient witnesses that this tradition of prayer is intended for all believers and that it was universally practiced in the early church. Like the sign of the cross and partaking of the holy mysteries of repentance and communion, the prayer of Jesus is one of the greatest gifts the Lord has entrusted to those who follow him in their struggle to perfect their salvation, to combat and overcome their human failings, to break free from sinful passions and weaknesses, and to participate in the sanctifying grace and love of Christ. The active offering of the prayer of Jesus is especially helpful for lay people and beginners in the spiritual life, provided they pray in humility, without untimely striving for experiences which are not suitable for their way of life and the condition of their soul. The artful practice of the prayer, mental prayer, and prayer of the heart are special gifts granted by God, 
who gives his grace to the humble. They are not the purpose of the prayer, even for Hesychast monastics living in advanced asceticism. Through his writings, Bishop Ignatius helps us guard against superficiality, sentimentalism, syncretism, and an unhealthy penchant for mystical thrills. He takes pains to clarify the role of material aids. He warns against forcing one's progress in prayer by employing the techniques described by the Holy Fathers without proper supervision. He points out where the subtle dangers of delusion are concealed. He also refutes certain bizarre distortions common in the West, which still mar the work of reputedly orthodox scholars. A humbled and contrite heart, he constantly reminds us, is the only sacrifice truly pleasing to God. Throughout his entire life, Bishop Ignatius was blessed to live among many holy persons with rare gifts of prayer and discretion. From his youth, he diligently studied the patristic works available to the Russian faithful at that time, especially the then only recently published translations of St. Paisius Velichkovsky. He was thoroughly immersed in the Hesychast tradition of Orthodox Christian monasticism, both as a disciple and co-struggler of genuine Hesychasts, and as a faithful student of the Hesychast writings. Beyond the blessing of fervent zeal for nourishing his mind and soul from the patristic writings, and the blessing of drawing on the guidance and counsels of his saintly contemporaries, Bishop Ignatius acquired yet another essential blessing from God. From his childhood, he became disenchanted with the illusory charms of this world, and sought his consolation in prayerful communion with Christ. He quickly realized the necessity of submission, obedience, patience, and self-rebuke. He diverted the bitter frustrations of his student years to fan the flames of the divine love kindled in his breast, to steal his resolve and keep himself on guard not to allow any disappointment or temptation to separate him from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He took refuge in the Lord, clinging to him in contrition and prayer, especially in the face of seemingly insurmountable afflictions. By accepting the often agonizing therapy administered by his heavenly physician, he prepared within himself a place for Christ to dwell, the one finding his repose in the other. As a military cadet, as a young officer, as abbot, and later as bishop, he was constantly laden with responsibilities, pressed by friends and spiritual children, harassed by his broken health and constant illnesses, and often persecuted and slandered as well. Nonetheless, in the midst of this seeming turmoil and endless swirl of activity, he became a true hesychast, attaining the stillness of the indwelling of Christ. The abundance of love engendered by this insatiable stillness made time for him to set down his instructions in writing and see that they were published in order to present us also with these timeless truths and unending task, unceasing prayer and life eternal. As the reader of this book will discover, the prayer of Jesus involves more than asking God for something. It is not simply a method for meditation or for disciplining the mind. It is life in Christ, calling the Savior into our thoughts and feelings, into our minds and hearts, into our entire life, both external and internal. In prayer we call upon Him, we commune with Him, we entreat His help in the face of difficulties or temptations, implore Him mercifully to forgive our sins and shortcomings, intercede for others, or find our consolation in being prayerfully in His presence. This life of prayer may have very modest beginnings in a person's daily activities, but with proper attention and care, the Lord Himself can not only use these grains of salt to preserve our life from corruption, but can transform a repentant believer into a saint in whom he himself can delight. Christ said, I am the way and the life and the truth. By never ceasing to invoke his precious name and to beg for his mercy, we find the way to him, begin to live in him more and more fully, and thus come to a knowledge of and participation in his everlasting truth. The teachings centering around the prayer of Jesus are often referred to in relation to what is known as hesychasm. Hesychasm is a term derived from a Greek word which means stillness, quiet, or rest. Its equivalent in the Slavic languages bears the meaning of freedom from distractions, anxiety, or concerns. The verse of the psalm comes to mind, Be still and know that I am God. In its narrow sense, 
Hesychasm is the name of a 14th century monastic movement in the Orthodox Church. Since this movement simply gave formal, systematic expression to a tradition of prayer and spiritual life which permeates the entire history of the Church, however, the term can be used in a wider sense, referring to the sacred tradition of the prayer of Jesus. Indeed, certain Hesychast writers find the roots and earliest expression of this tradition in the writings of the Old Testament as well as the New, and even in the commandment given by the Creator to Adam in Paradise, to guard and cultivate the Garden of Eden. Watchfulness, guarding the mind and heart, vigilance over one's thoughts, keeping the memory of God and other such terms are also employed in discussing this tradition of continuous prayer. These terms refer to the sustained internal effort and struggle that is required to keep one's mind and thoughts pure and concentrated on prayer, on begging for mercy from the Lord Jesus Christ. Bishop Ignatius emphasizes that the living continuum of the practice and teachings concerning the prayer of Jesus finds its origin in the words of the Lord himself recorded in the Holy Gospels. He traces it through the apostles and apostolic fathers to the church fathers, both of ancient times and those of the later centuries, down to his own days. Since then, this tradition has been kept alive in the bastions of Orthodox monasticism, in particular on Mount Athos. It has also thrived in a special way under the unprecedented persecutions that have been visited upon most of the historically Orthodox peoples during the present century. At the same time, an impressive and growing body of literature on this aspect of Christian spirituality has been made available to the reader of English. Together with other expressions of Orthodox Christianity, such as its traditional iconography, architecture, chanting, and liturgy, this literature has helped many persons discover their true Christian heritage and the homeland they long for in the Holy Orthodox Church. In the early Church, the life of prayerful invocation of the name of Jesus flourished among the faithful. It found a special place in the ascetic discipline of the early desert fathers in Egypt and Palestine. Prior to the schism of the Latin Church from the Christian East, there was a universal Catholic tradition of this prayer life, which is recorded in the writings of many church fathers in Latin and Syriac, as well as in Greek. There were times, however, when this tradition fell into widespread neglect, when it seemed to lie dormant or was even persecuted. The 13th century of Tatar and Latin domination over Orthodox lands was a particularly dark period. Yet St. Gregory of Sinai, by God's grace, discovered the elder Arsenius in Crete, and St. Maximus Capsocalavitis, and a handful of Athenite monks who lived according to this tradition. St. Gregory imparted it to a host of disciples, both Greek and Slav, thus giving rise to the Hesychast revival of the 14th century. This movement met with severe opposition from the disciples of scholastic theology. Many of the most valuable patristic works on the prayer of Jesus were written to refute this opposition. The movement began on the holy mountain Athos, but quickly spread throughout the Byzantine East, the Balkans, and Russia's northern Thibet. Likewise, during the 17th and 18th centuries, Turkish rule and Western influence once again threatened to smother this tradition of Orthodox spiritual life. Saints Macarius of Corinth and Saint Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain uncovered old Greek manuscripts, primarily in the monastery libraries on Mount Athos, which contained invaluable collections of the writings of Church Fathers on prayer and spiritual life. After carefully establishing a reliable text of these writings, they published them in five volumes in Greek, under the title The Philokalia, which means The Love of Beauty or Excellence. This anthology contains works from some of the first fathers of the Egyptian desert and from a wide selection of ascetic writers of many different times and places, each giving valuable instructions and insights into what is a single, continuous tradition. The first three volumes have been published in English translation. The last two are still being prepared, but many of the works they contain are available in English in other books. Editor's Note The fourth volume has also recently been published. St. Paisius Velichkovsky was a contemporary of Saints Macarius and Nicodemus. He was born in the Russian Empire, where he also entered the monastic life. St. Paisius's search for a holy elder and monks who lived in the Hesychast tradition brought him to Wallachia, 
where he found such a guide in Elder Basil of Merilai Poyana. In the further course of his life on Mount Athos and in Moldavia, St. Paisius collected and retranslated patristic works, including many of those contained in the Philokalia for Slavic readers. Most of these translations were published at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th centuries. More important, however, St. Paisius himself lived this discipline and trained disciples who passed it on to further generations. It was through some of St. Paisius' disciples that the youth who was later to write this book on the prayer of Jesus was guided in the Hezekiah tradition. In directing us into the radiance of the never-ending day, Bishop Ignatius explains how to be guided by these stars that adorn the spiritual firmament, each resplendent with a unique glory, yet each imparting the light that enables us to see in the dark. He locates certain of them in individual chapters of this little book as he charts the course which they all illumine, a course indicated by the compass of the heart pointed and drawn to the all-pervading love of Christ. On the Prayer of Jesus In beginning to speak of the Prayer of Jesus, I invoke the aid of the All-Good and Almighty Jesus that he may assist my dullness. In beginning to speak of the Prayer of Jesus, I recall the righteous Simeon's utterance concerning the Lord. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Luke 2.34 Just as the Lord was and is a true sign, the sign that is spoken against, an object of dispute and disagreement between those who know him and those who do not, so too prayer in his all-holy name, which in the fullest sense is a great and wonderful sign, has become a subject of dispute and disagreement between those who practice it and those who do not. A certain father justly remarks that this way of prayer is rejected only by those who do not know it. They reject it through prejudice and through false ideas that they have formed of it. Without paying any attention to the outcries of prejudice and ignorance, trusting in the mercy and help of God, we offer, beloved fathers and brothers, our poor treatise on the prayer of Jesus, on the basis of Holy Scripture, on the basis of Church tradition, on the basis of the writings of the Fathers in which the teaching of this all-holy and all-powerful prayer is expounded. Speechless be the deceitful lips which speak iniquity against his just and magnificent name with arrogance and contempt in their profound ignorance and abuse of God's wonders. As we consider the greatness of the name of Jesus and the saving power of prayer in that name, we cry with spiritual joy and amazement. How great is the multitude of thy goodness, O Lord, which thou hast hid for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that hope in thee before the sons of men. Psalms 30, 18-20 The prayer of Jesus is said like this, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Originally, it was said without the addition of the word sinner. This word was added to the other words of the prayer later. This word, remarks St. Neil Sorsky, which implies a consciousness and confession of the fall, is fitting for us and pleasing to God who has commanded us to offer prayers in acknowledgment and confession of our sinfulness. St. Neil Sorsky, Chapter 2 The fathers allow beginners, in deference to their weakness, to divide the prayer into two halves, and sometimes to say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner, and sometimes, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. But this is only a concession or indulgence, and not at all an order or rule requiring unfailing compliance. It is much better to say constantly the same whole prayer without distracting and bothering the mind with changes or with concern about changes. Even he who finds a change necessary for his weakness should not allow it often. For example, the first half of the prayer can be prayed till dinner, and the other after dinner. St. Gregory the Sinite forbids frequent change, saying, Trees that are often transplanted do not take root. Praying by the prayer of Jesus is a divine institution. It was instituted not by means of an apostle or by means of an angel. It was instituted by the Son of God and God himself. After the mystical supper, among other sublime final commandments and orders, the Lord Jesus Christ instituted prayer by his name. He gave this way of prayer as a new, extraordinary gift, a gift of infinite value. 
The apostles partly knew already the power of the name of Jesus. They healed incurable diseases by it. They reduced devils to obedience, conquered, bound, and expelled them by it. This most mighty, wonderful name the Lord orders us to use in prayer. He promised that such prayer will be particularly effectual. Whatsoever ye shall ask, he said to the holy apostles, the Father, in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, 13-14 Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. John 16, 23-24 What a wonderful gift! It is a guarantee of unending infinite blessings. It came from the lips of the unlimited God, clothed in limited humanity, and called by the human name of Savior. The name by its exterior form is limited, but it represents the unlimited God, from whom it borrows infinite divine value or worth, the power and properties of God. O giver of a priceless, incorruptible gift, how can we sinful mortals receive the gift? Neither our hands, nor our mind, nor our heart are capable of receiving it. Do thou teach us to know, as far as we are able, the greatness of the gift, and its significance, and the ways of receiving it, and the ways of using it, that we may not approach the gift in a sinful manner, that we may not be punished for indiscretion and audacity, but that, for the right understanding and use of the gift, we may receive from thee other gifts, promised by thee, known only to thee. From the Gospels, the Acts, and the Apostolic Epistles, we see the unbounded faith of the holy apostles in the name of the Lord Jesus, and their unbounded reverence for this name. By the name of the Lord Jesus, they performed the most striking miracles. There is no instance from which we can learn how they prayed in the name of the Lord, but that is certainly how they prayed. How could they do otherwise when that prayer was given and commanded them by the Lord himself? and when the order was confirmed by a twofold repetition of it. If Scripture is silent about it, it is silent only because this prayer was in general use and was so well known that it needed no special mention in Scripture. Even in the monuments of the first ages of Christianity that have come down to us, prayer in the name of the Lord is not treated separately, but is only mentioned in connection with other matters. In the life of St. Ignatius the God-bearer, Bishop of Antioch, who was crowned in Rome with a martyr's death under the Emperor Trajan, we read the following. When they were taking him to be devoured by wild beasts, and he had the name of Jesus constantly on his lips, the pagans asked him why he unceasingly remembered that name. The saint replied that he had the name of Jesus written in his heart, and that he confessed with his mouth him whom he always carried in his heart. After the saint had been eaten by the wild beasts, by the will of God, among his bones, his heart was preserved intact. The infidels found it, and then remembered what St. Ignatius had said. So they cut that heart into two halves, wishing to know whether what they had been told was true. Inside, on the two halves of the heart that had been cut open, they found an inscription in gold letters, Jesus Christ. Thus St. Ignatius was in name, and in fact a God-bearer, always carrying Christ our God in his heart, written by the reflection of his mind as with the reed. St. Ignatius was a disciple of the holy apostle and evangelist John the Divine and was privileged in his childhood to see the Lord Jesus Christ personally. He was that blessed child of whom it is said in the gospel that the Lord placed him among the apostles who had been arguing about priority, took him in his arms and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18, 3-4 Certainly, St. Ignatius was taught the prayer of Jesus by the holy evangelist and practiced it in that flourishing period of Christianity like all other Christians. At that time, all Christians learned the prayer of Jesus, firstly, on account of the great importance of the prayer itself, and then, on account of the scarcity and costliness of the handwritten holy books, on account of the rarity of literacy, 
as most of the apostles were illiterate, and on account of the convenience, satisfaction, and very special action and power of the prayer of Jesus. In church history, we read the following incident. A soldier called Neocorus, a native of Carthage, was in the Roman garrison guarding Jerusalem at the time when our Lord Jesus Christ suffered his voluntary passion and death for the redemption of the human race. Seeing the miracles worked at the Lord's death and resurrection, Neocorus believed in the Lord and was baptized by the apostles. After finishing his term of service, Neocorus returned to Carthage and shared the treasure of faith with his whole family. Among those who accepted Christianity was Callistratus, Neocorus's grandson. On reaching the required age, Callistratus joined the army. The detachment of soldiers to which he was drafted consisted of idolaters. They watched Callistratus and noticed that he did not worship the idols but spent a long time in prayer at night alone. Once they eavesdropped while he was praying and heard that he constantly repeated the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they reported him to the commanding officer. St. Callistratus, who confessed Jesus alone in the dark at night, also confessed him publicly in the light of day and sealed his confession with his blood. Menology, September 27. Teaching on the prayer of Jesus appears in the church writers of the 4th century, such as St. John Chrysostom and St. Isaiah the Solitary. A writer of the 5th century, St. Ezekiel of Jerusalem, already complains that the practice of this prayer has greatly declined among monks. As time went on, this decline increased more and more. So the Holy Fathers tried by their writings to encourage the practice. The last writer on this prayer was the blessed elder Hero monk Seraphim of Sarov. The elder himself did not write the instructions bearing his name. They were written down from his words by one of the monks under his direction. But they are written with remarkable unction. Now the practice of the prayer of Jesus has been almost abandoned by monks and nuns. St. Ezekiel names carelessness as the cause of this neglect. It must be admitted that this accusation is just. The gracious power of the prayer of Jesus is contained in the divine name itself of the God-man, our Lord Jesus Christ. Although there is abundant evidence in Holy Scripture proving the greatness of the name of God, yet the importance of this name was explained with special precision by the holy apostle Peter before the Jewish Sanhedrin, when the council asked the apostle by what power or by what name he had given healing to a man lame from birth. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means is he made whole? Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, 7-12 This witness is the testimony of the Holy Spirit. The apostles' mouth, tongue, and voice were merely the Spirit's instruments. Another organ of the Holy Spirit, the apostle of the Gentiles, gives similar evidence. Whosoever, he says, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Romans 10.13 Christ Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth. Philippians 2.5-10 Seeing the distant future, David, an ancestor of Jesus according to the flesh, sang the greatness of the name of Jesus, and vividly described the effect of this name, the struggle by means of it with the principles of sin, its power to deliver those who pray by it from captivity to the passions and demons, and the triumph of those who win a spiritual victory by the name of Jesus. Let us listen to inspired David. O Lord, our Lord, he cries, how wonderful is thy name in all the earth! 
for thy magnificence is lifted high above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou perfected praise, because of thine enemies, to destroy the enemy and avenger. Psalm 8, 2 Exactly. The greatness of the name of Jesus is beyond the comprehension of rational creatures of heaven and earth. The comprehension of it is incomprehensibly grasped by childlike simplicity and faith. In this same disinterested spirit, we must approach prayer in the name of Jesus and continue in that prayer. Our perseverance and attention in prayer must be like the constant striving of an infant for his mother's breasts. Then, prayer in the name of Jesus will be crowned with complete success. The invisible foes will be defeated, and the enemy and avenger will be finally crushed. The enemy is called the avenger because he tries to take from those who pray after prayer what they have obtained during prayer. In order to win a decisive victory, unceasing prayer and constant vigilance are indispensable. Open to all. On account of the importance of prayer in the name of Jesus, David invites all Christians to the practice of this prayer. Praise the Lord, O ye servants. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from henceforth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Psalms 112, 1-3 Bring unto the Lord glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in his holy court. Psalms 28, 2 Pray in this way, so that in your prayers the greatness of the name of Jesus may be manifested, and by its power you may rise to the inner temple not made with hands, the temple of the heart, and worship in spirit and truth. Pray carefully and constantly. Pray in fear and trembling before the greatness of the name of Jesus, and let them hope in thee, the Almighty and all-good Jesus, who know thy name from their own blessed experience, for thou hast not forsaken them that seek thee, O Lord. Psalms 9, 10-11 Only the poor in spirit, who cling constantly to the Lord by prayer on account of the constant sense of their poverty and need, are capable of discovering within themselves the greatness of the name of Jesus. Let not the humbled man be turned away and disappointed in his prayer, but let him offer to God whole, not torn by distraction. The beggar and the poor man shall praise thy name. Psalm 73, 21 Blessed is the man whose hope is in the name of the Lord, and who hath not looked upon vanities and false frenzies. Psalms 39, 6 He will not pay any attention during his prayer to the seductive action of vain cares and passions which attempt to defile and spoil his prayer. Nighttime is particularly helpful for the practice of the prayer of Jesus on account of the darkness and silence. At night, that great man of prayer, David, occupied himself with the remembrance of God. I remembered thy name in the night, O Lord, he says. I tuned my soul at night to a divine pitch, and having acquired that pitch in the activity of the following day, I kept thy law. Psalms 118.55 At night, advises St. Gregory the Sinite, quoting St. John of the Ladder, devote much time to prayer and little to psalmody. In the grim struggle with the invisible enemies of our salvation, the supreme weapon is the prayer of Jesus. All the nations, the vociferous and wily demons are called nations, compassed me, says David, and by the name of the Lord I warded them off. Surrounding me they compassed me, and by the name of the Lord I warded them off. They compassed me about like unto bees around a honeycomb, and they burst into flame like a fire among the thorns, and by the name of the Lord I warded them off. Psalms 117, 10-12 With the name of Jesus, flog the foes, because there is no stronger weapon in heaven or earth. Ladder of Paradise, 21, 7 Through thee, Lord Jesus, shall the horn of our strength push down our enemies, and through thy name shall we bring to naught them that rise up against us. For not in my bow will I hope, and my sword shall not save me. For thou hast saved us from them that afflict us, and them that hate us hast thou put to shame. In God we will boast all the day long, and in thy name we will give praise in the age to come. Psalms 43, 6-9 Having conquered and dispersed the enemies by the name of Jesus, the mind joins the ranks of the blessed spirits, 
and enters for true worship into the temple of the heart which had previously been closed to it, singing a new spiritual song, singing mystically, I will confess thee, O Lord, with my whole heart, and before angels will I chant unto thee, for thou hast heard all the words of my mouth. I will worship towards thy holy temple and confess thy name, for thy mercy and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy holy name above all that is. In whatsoever day I call upon thee, quickly hearken unto me. Thou shalt abundantly endow my soul with thy strength. Psalms 137, 1 to 3. Saint David enumerates the wonderful effects of the holy and terrible name of Jesus. Psalms 110, 8. It acts like a medicine whose way of acting is unknown and incomprehensible to the patient, but whose effect is obvious from the healing produced. For the sake of the name of Jesus used by one who prays, help comes down to him from God, and he is granted the forgiveness of his sins. For this reason, holy David, presenting to the gaze of God the forlorn and wretched state of the soul of every man produced by a sinful life, prays in the person of all men for mercy, saying, Help us, O God our Savior, for the sake of the glory of thy name. O Lord, deliver us and be gracious unto our sins for thy name's sake. Psalms 78, 9 For the sake of the Lord's name, our prayer is heard, and we are granted salvation. On the basis of this conviction, again David prays, O God, in thy name save me, and in thy strength do thou judge me. O God, hearken unto my prayer, give ear unto the words of my mouth. Psalms 53, 1-2 By the power of the name of Jesus, the mind is freed from doubt, indecision, and hesitation. The will is strengthened, and correctness is given to zeal and other properties of the soul. Then only thoughts and feelings pleasing to God, thoughts and feelings belonging to undepraved human nature, only such thoughts and feelings are allowed to remain in the soul. There is no place, then, for other thoughts and feelings. For God will save Zion, and the cities of Judea shall be builded, and they shall dwell therein and inherit it. And the seed of thy servants shall possess it, and they that love thy name shall dwell therein. Psalms 68, 40-41 In the name of the Lord Jesus, quickening is given to the soul deadened by sin. The Lord Jesus Christ is life, and his name is living. It revives and quickens those who cry by it to the source of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. For thy name's sake, O Lord, shalt thou quicken me in thy righteousness. Psalms 142, 11-12 We will not depart from thee. Thou shalt quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Psalms 79, 19 When by the power and action of the name of Jesus a man's prayer is heard, when divine assistance comes down to him, when his enemies are defeated and leave him in peace, when he is granted the forgiveness of his sins, when he is healed and restored to the state of unsullied nature, when his spirit comes into its own authority. Then follows the giving of spiritual gifts in the name of the Lord, spiritual goods and treasure, a pledge of blessed eternity. For thou, O God, hast heard my prayer. Thou hast given an inheritance to them that fear thy name. Days shalt thou add to the days of the king, his years unto days for generation and generation. He shall abide before the face of God in the age to come. Psalms 65-7 Then a man becomes able to sing unto the Lord a new song. He ceases to be of the number of the carnal and natural, and joins the ranks of the spiritual with whom he praises the Lord in the church of the saints. Psalms 149-1 The Holy Spirit, who has hitherto invited and urged him only to weeping and penitence, now invites him to rejoice. Let Israel be glad in him that made him. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. With the timbrel and the psaltery, let them chant unto him. Psalms 149, 2. That is because, after the soul's renewal, its powers are brought into wonderful accord and harmony, and at the touch of divine grace become capable of producing spiritual sounds and tunes pleasing to God, which rise to heaven before the throne of God. Let my heart rejoice that I may fear thy name. I will confess thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forever. For great is thy mercy upon me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the nethermost Hades. Psalms 85, 10-12 The righteous shall confess thy name, and the upright shall dwell in thy presence. Psalms 139, 13 
That is because, after the repulsion of the enemies, which cause distraction and weaken and defile prayer, the mind enters the darkness of the unseen and stands in the presence of God, without any means or intermediary. This spiritual darkness is that veil, that curtain, which hides the face of God. That veil is the incomprehensibility of God for all created minds. Compunction of heart, then, becomes so powerful that it is called confession. David depicts the blessed effect of the prayer of Jesus in a proficient Christian thus, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Psalms 102, 1. Exactly at the abundant action of the prayer of Jesus, all the powers of the soul and even the body take part in it. The practice of the prayer of Jesus by Holy David, or more accurately, the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David, offers to all Christians without exception, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all the judges of the earth, young men and virgins, elders with the younger, let them praise the name of the Lord, for exalted is the name of him alone. Psalms 148, 11-12 A literal understanding of the states enumerated here would be perfectly permissible, but their essential meaning is spiritual. By people is meant all Christians. By kings is meant Christians who have been granted to attain perfection. By princes, those who have made very considerable progress. By judges is meant those who have not yet acquired authority over themselves, but being acquainted with the law of God, they can distinguish good from evil, and by the guidance and requirement of the law of God, they can continue in good and reject evil. Virgin denotes all the female sex and the detached heart which is so apt for prayer. Elders and the young indicate degrees of bodily growth and degrees of active progress, which is very different from grace-given progress, though the former has its very real value. He who has reached perfection in active prayer is called an elder, while he who has been raised to grace-given perfection is a king. Power to Expel Demons among the mysterious, wonderful properties of the name of Jesus is the power and property of expelling demons. This property was disclosed by the Lord himself. He said of those who believe in him, In my name shall they cast out devils. Mark 16:17. Special attention must be paid to this property of the name of Jesus, because it is of the greatest importance for those practicing the prayer of Jesus. First of all, a few words must be said concerning the dwelling of demons in human beings. This occurs in two ways. One can be called sensible, the other moral. Satan dwells sensibly in a man when with his being he occupies the man's body and tortures body and soul. In this way, it is possible for one devil to live in a man, and it is also possible for many devils to live in the same man. Then a man is called possessed or a demoniac. From the gospel we see that our Lord healed people possessed with devils. The Lord's disciples also healed them. They expelled demons from people by the name of the Lord. Satan dwells morally in a man when the man becomes a door of the devil's will. It was in this way that Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, John 13:27. That is, he controlled his reason and will and became one with him in spirit. All non-believers in Christ were and are in this state, as the Holy Apostle Paul says to Christians who had been converted to Christianity from paganism. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Ephesians 2, 1-3 In this state, more or less, according to the degree of their sinfulness, are those who have been baptized into Christ, but who have become estranged from him by sin. That is how the Holy Fathers understand Christ's words regarding the return of the devil with seven other more evil spirits to the temple of the soul from which it had been expelled by the Holy Spirit. Matthew 12:43-45 When spirits enter in this way, they can be driven out again by the prayer of Jesus, accompanied by a life of constant and diligent penitence. 
Let us take up this neglected work so directly concerned with our salvation. Let us do all in our power to expel demons that have entered us through our negligence by the prayer of Jesus. It has the property of reviving those deadened by sin, and it has the property of driving out devils. I am the resurrection and the life, said the Savior. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John 11:25. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Mark 16:17. The prayer of Jesus both reveals the presence of demons in a man and drives them out of the man. Herein is accomplished something like what took place when the Lord expelled the demon from the possessed boy after his transfiguration. When the lad saw the Lord coming, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. Mark 9:20. When the Lord commanded the evil spirit to leave its victim, out of malice and wickedness as it came out, it shrieked out and violently convulsed the boy so that it seemed as if he were dead. The power of Satan, which dwells unnoticed and unrealized in a man as a result of his dissolute life, when it hears the name of the Lord Jesus invoked in prayer, becomes agitated and confused. It stirs up all the passions and by this means reduces the whole man to a terrible state of agitation and produces in the body various strange maladies. It was in this connection that St. John the Prophet said, It only remains for us weak creatures to have recourse to the name of Jesus, for the passions are demons, and depart at the invocation of this name. That means that the action of the passions and demons is a combined action. The demons act by means of the passions. When we see a special disturbance and excitement of the passions accompanying the prayer of Jesus, let us not be dejected or perplexed by it. On the contrary, let us take courage and prepare ourselves for the struggle and for the most diligent prayer in the name of Jesus, as having received a clear sign that the prayer of Jesus has begun to produce its proper effect in us. St. John Chrysostom says, The remembrance of the name of Jesus rouses the enemy to battle. For a soul that forces itself to pray the prayer of Jesus can find anything by this prayer, both good and evil. First, it can see evil in the recesses of its own heart, and afterwards, good. This prayer can stir the snake to action, and this prayer can lay it low. This prayer can expose the sin that is living in us, and this prayer can eradicate it. This prayer can stir up in the heart all the power of the enemy, and this prayer can conquer it and gradually root it out. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ as it descends into the depths of the heart, will subdue the snake which controls its ranges and will save and quicken the soul. Continue constantly in the name of the Lord Jesus, that the heart may swallow the Lord and the Lord the heart, and that these two may be one. However, this is not accomplished in a single day, nor in two days, but requires many years and much time. Much time and labor are needed in order to expel the enemy and instate Christ. Evidently, here is described that activity of which St. Macarius the Great speaks, and to which he invites people in his first word, with a clear indication as to the weapon of that warfare. He says, Force your way in, whoever you are, through the thoughts that incessantly rise up within you to that prisoner of war and slave of sin, your soul, and look to the very bottom of your mind and examine the depth of your thoughts, and you will see nestling and creeping in the inner recesses of your soul the snake which killed you by poisoning the vital parts of your soul. The heart is an unfathomable abyss. If you kill that snake, glory in your purity before God. But if not, humble yourself as one who is weak and sinful, and pray to God for deliverance from your secret sins. St. Marcarius, Word 1, Chapter 1. The same great servant of God says, the kingdom of darkness, that is, the evil prince of spirits, having taken man captive at the beginning, enveloped and clothed his soul in the power of darkness. This evil ruler clothed the soul and all its substance with sin. He defiled it all and brought it all into captivity to his kingdom. He did not leave one member of it free from slavery to himself, neither the thoughts nor the understanding nor the body. He clothed it all with the purple of darkness." this evil enemy has defiled and disfigured the entire man, soul, and body. He has clothed man in the old man, defiled, unclean, 
enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Romans 8, 7. That is, he has clothed him in sin itself, so that man may no longer see as he wishes, but may see passionately and hear passionately, and have feet prone to evil deeds, hands to commit sin, and a heart inclined to evil thoughts. But let us implore God to put off the old man from us, since he alone can take away sin from us. For those that have taken us captive and that detain us in their kingdom are too mighty for us. But he has promised to deliver us from this slavery. Homilies 2, 1-2 to On the basis of these ideas, the Holy Fathers give to those who pray the prayer of Jesus the following instructions. Unless the soul suffers greatly over the shamelessness of sin, it cannot rejoice abundantly over the goodness of justice. Whoever wishes to purify his heart, let him burn it out continually with the remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ, making this his one unceasing meditation and work. Those who desire to renounce their old nature must not sometimes pray and sometimes not, but must unceasingly devote themselves to prayer with watchfulness of mind, even when they are outside temples of prayer. Those who intend to purify gold, if even for a short time they allow the fire to go out in the furnace, they produce hardening again in the material that is being purified. Similarly, he who sometimes remembers God and sometimes forgets Him ruins by sloth what he thinks to acquire by prayer. It is part of a virtue-loving man constantly to root out earthliness of heart by the remembrance of God, so that in this way evil may be gradually consumed by the fire of the remembrance of good, and the soul may be perfectly restored to its natural brightness with greater glory. Thus, by remaining in the heart, the mind prays purely and without delusion. As the same saint, Diodocus, has said, prayer is true and free from delusion when the mind keeps watch over the heart at the time that it prays. Saints Callistus and Ignatius. Directions to Hesychas, chapter 56 from the Philokalia. Let us not be scared, practicers of the prayer of Jesus, either by winds or waves. By winds, I mean diabolic thoughts and imaginings and by waves the revolt of the passions aroused by thoughts and reveries. From the midst of the most furious storm, with perseverance, courage, and weeping, you will cry to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will rebuke the winds and waves. And having learned from experience the omnipotence of Jesus, we shall render to him due adoration, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Matthew 14.33 We are fighting for our salvation. On our victory or defeat depends our eternal destiny. Then, says St. Simeon, the new theologian, that is, during the practice of the prayer of Jesus, there is a battle. The evil spirits fight with great confusion and produce by means of the passions a storm and rebellion in the heart. But by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are consumed and destroyed like wax by fire. Yet when they are repulsed and retreat from the heart, they do not abandon the struggle but they disturb the mind from without through the exterior senses. For this reason, the mind does not very soon begin to experience calm and quiet within itself, because when the demons have not the power to disturb the mind in its depths, they disturb it from without by fantasies. And therefore, it is impossible to be completely free from conflict and not to be attacked by evil spirits. That belongs only to the perfect and to those who are completely detached from everything, and whose attention remains constantly in the heart, Philokalia, on the third way of attention. At first, the practice of the prayer of Jesus appears to be extraordinarily dry and seems to promise no fruit. As the mind strives to unite with the heart, it meets at first with impenetrable darkness and gloom, hardness and deadness of the heart, which is not quickly aroused to sympathy with the mind. This should not cause despondency in cowardice, it is mentioned here since to be forewarned is to be forearmed. The patient and diligent worker will not fail to be satisfied and consoled. He will rejoice at an infinite abundance of spiritual fruits such as he can form no conception of in his carnal and natural state. There are degrees of the action of the prayer of Jesus. At first it acts only on the mind, leading it into a state of calm and attention. Afterwards, it begins to penetrate to the heart, arousing it from the sleep of death, 
and making its revival known by the manifestation within it of feelings of compunction and sorrow. As it goes still deeper, it gradually begins to act upon all the members of the soul and body and to expel sin from every part and everywhere to destroy the dominion, influence, and poison of the demons. For this reason, at the first actions of the prayer of Jesus, there occurs unutterable contrition and unspeakable pain of soul, says St. Gregory the Sinite. The soul suffers like a sick man or a woman in travail, Ecclesiasticus 48.21. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4.12, eradicating sinfulness from all parts of the soul and the body. When the seventy lesser apostles, whom the Lord sent on a preaching tour, returned to him after carrying out their appointed ministry, they told the Lord with joy, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name, Luke 10.17. Oh, how just was that joy! How reasonable it was! For more than five thousand years the devil had ruled over men, making them his slaves and relatives by means of sin. And now he hears the name of Jesus and is subject to men who have hitherto been subject to him, is bound by those whom he had bound, is trampled on by those on whom he had trampled. In reply to the disciples who were rejoicing over the conquest of the power of the devils over men, and men's obtaining power over the demons, the Lord said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 10.19 The power was given, but freedom was reserved to use the power and trample on snakes and scorpions, or to despise the gift and voluntarily be subject to them. Under the names of snakes, the Holy Fathers understand openly sinful undertakings, and by scorpions they understand things camouflaged with an exterior of innocence and even goodness. The power given by the Lord to his seventy disciples is given to all Christians. Mark 16:17. Use it, Christian. With the name of Jesus, cut off their heads, that is, the first appearances of sin in our thoughts, fancies, and feelings. Destroy within you the devil's rule over you. Destroy all his influence over you. Acquire spiritual freedom. The foundation for your struggle is the grace of holy baptism. Your weapon is prayer in the name of Jesus. Having given his disciples power to trample on snakes and scorpions, the Lord added, Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Luke 10.20 Rejoice, says Blessed Theophylact, not so much over the fact that devils are subject to you as over the fact that your names are written in heaven, not with ink, but by divine grace and the remembrance of God through the prayer of Jesus. Such is the property of the prayer of Jesus. It leads its practiser from earth to heaven and places him among the celestial inhabitants dwelling with the mind and heart in heaven and in God. That is the chief fruit. That is the end of prayer. The repulsion and defeat of the enemies which oppose the attainment of this end is a secondary matter. It should not deflect to itself all our attention, lest the realization and consideration of victory should give entry to pride and self-confidence, and we suffer a crushing defeat through our very victory. Further on, the Gospel relates... In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. And, turning to the disciples, he said, All things are delivered to me of my Father. Luke 10, 21-22 The Lord rejoices with the incomprehensible joy of God at the success of men. He declares that the mysteries of the Christian faith are revealed not to the wise and exalted of the world, but to those who are children as regards civil affairs, such as were the Lord's disciples taken from among the simple people, unlearned, illiterate. In order to become a disciple of the Lord, we must become infants, and with childlike simplicity and love accept His teaching. 
To those who have become his disciples, the Lord explains his most mystical teaching. He reveals that the Son, in spite of his assuming humanity, remains above the comprehension of all rational creatures. Above their comprehension also is his most holy name. With the simplicity and trust of children, let us receive the teaching on prayer in the name of Jesus. With the simplicity and trust of children, let us approach the practice of this prayer. God, who alone fully knows the secret of it, will give it us in a degree accessible to us. Let us give joy to God by our labors and progress in the service which he has taught and commanded us. Greek and Russian Guides The prayer of Jesus was in general use among Christians of the first ages, as we have already said. It could not be otherwise. By the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the most striking miracles were performed in the presence of the whole Christian community, which encouraged the whole of Christian society to cherish faith in the unbounded power of the name of Jesus. Those who were successful understood this power from their own success. Concerning this power, which was developed abundantly among God's saints, St. Barsanufius the Great writes, I know one servant of God in our generation who can even raise the dead in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and can drive out demons and heal incurable diseases, and can do other miracles no less apostolic, as is promised by him who gave him the gift, or more exactly, the gifts. Yes, and what is that in comparison with what can be done in the name of Jesus? Answer 181. See also John 14.12. Having miracles before their eyes, the Lord's command in their memory, and flaming love for the Lord in their heart, the faithful of the primitive church constantly, diligently, and with the fiery zeal of cherubim and seraphim, exercise themselves in the prayer by the name of Jesus. Such is the property of love. It constantly remembers the Beloved. It unceasingly delights in the name of the Beloved. It keeps it in its heart, and has it in its mind and on its lips. The name of the Lord is above every name. It is a source of delight, a source of joy, a source of life. It is spirit. It quickens, transforms, purifies, deifies. For the illiterate, it can replace in a completely satisfactory manner vocal prayer and psalmody. The literate, having made some progress in the prayer of Jesus, give up the variety of psalmody and begin preeminently to practice the prayer of Jesus on account of the superabundant power and nourishment contained in it. All this is apparent from the writings and rules of the Holy Fathers. St. Basil the Great offers to all who are illiterate, instead of the appointed prayers, the prayer of Jesus, and he does not offer it as a novelty, but as a generally known exercise. This rule of St. Basil, with other traditions of the Eastern Church, passed from Greece to Russia, and many of the simple people with little education, and even those who were quite illiterate, found salvation and eternal life through the prayer of Jesus. Many attained great spiritual proficiency. St. John Chrysostom, in recommending the diligent and constant practice of the prayer of Jesus, especially for monks, speaks of it as of something widely known. And we also have spiritual exorcisms, he says, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the cross. This exorcism not only drives the dragon out of his lair and casts him into the fire, but it even heals the wounds caused by him. If many used this exorcism and were not healed, this was due to their lack of faith and not to the ineffectualness of the exorcism. Although many constantly followed Christ and crowded round him, yet they got no benefit. But the woman with an issue of blood, who did not touch his body but only the hem of his garment, had a long-standing flow of blood stopped. The name of Jesus Christ is terrible for demons, passions of the soul, and diseases. Let us adorn and protect ourselves with it. Through it, too, Paul, the Apostle, became great on the Epistle to the Romans, homily 8. An angel of God taught St. Pacomius the Great a rule of prayer for the vast community of monks dependent on him. The monks, under the spiritual direction of St. Pacomius, had to perform the rule every day. Only those who had attained perfection and the unceasing prayer connected with it were freed from the obligation to perform the rule. The rule taught by the angel consisted of the Trisagion, the Lord's Prayer, Psalm 50, the symbol of faith, and 100 Jesus' prayers. 
In the rule, the prayer of Jesus is spoken of like the Lord's Prayer, that is, as prayers generally known and in general use. St. Barsanufius the Great says that the principal occupation of the monks of Skeet in Egypt was prayer. This is also evident from the life of St. Pamba, monk and Abba of the Nitrian mountain, not far from Skeet, where, as in Skeet, the monks spent their life in silence. Of the saints of God mentioned in this article who practiced or wrote about the prayer of Jesus, St. Ignatius the God-bearer lived in Antioch and died in Rome. The holy martyr Callistratus was a native and inhabitant of Carthage. St. Pacomius the Great lived in Upper Egypt. The monks of Skeet and Nitria, like St. Isaiah, lived in Lower Egypt. St. John Chrysostom lived in Antioch and Constantinople. St. Basil the Great lived in the eastern half of Asia Minor in Cappadocia. St. Barsanufius the Great lived in the vicinity of Jerusalem. St. John of the Latter lived on Mount Sinai and for some time in Lower Egypt near Alexandria. It is therefore evident that prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus was universal, in general use throughout the Catholic Church. Besides the fathers already mentioned, the following also wrote about the prayer of Jesus. St. Hezekias, a priest of Jerusalem, a disciple of St. Gregory the Theologian, a writer of the 5th century, who already complains of the neglect of the practice of the prayer of Jesus and vigilance by the monks of that time. St. Philotheus the Sinite, St. Simeon the New Theologian, St. Gregory the Sinite, St. Theolyptus of Philadelphia, St. Gregory Palamas, Saints Callistus and Ignatius, and many others. Their writings are mostly to be found in that extensive collection of ascetic authors, the Philokalia. Russian fathers who have written on the subject are St. Neil Sorsky, the holy monk Dorotheus, Archimandrit Paisius Velichkovsky, the monk of the great habit Vasily Palyanomorulsky, and hero monk Seraphim Asarov. All the writings of the fathers we have named deserve deep study on account of the abundance of grace and spiritual understanding which which they are suffused and which they exhale. But the works of the Russian fathers, on account of their special clarity and simplicity of expression, and on account of their greater nearness to us in point of time, are more accessible to us than the writings of the Greek lights. In particular, the writings of the elder Vasily can and should be recognized as the first book to which anyone who desires to practice the prayer of Jesus successfully in our time should certainly turn. And that is its purpose. The elder called his writings preambles, introductions, or the sort of reading that prepares the way for the study of the Greek fathers. An excellent book is that of St. Neil Sorsky. It should also be read before reading the Greek writers. It constantly refers to them and explains them, and so prepares the way for reading and understanding aright those deep-thinking holy authors who are often rhetorical, philosophical, and poetic. Generally speaking, all the works of the Holy Fathers on the monastic life, and particularly on the prayer of Jesus, constitute for us monks of the last times a priceless treasure. In the time of St. Neil Sorsky, three centuries before us, living vessels of divine grace were extremely rare, had diminished exceedingly, according to his expression. Now they are so rare that it will scarcely be an exaggeration to say that they no longer exist. It is considered a very special mercy of God if anyone, exhausted in soul and body in the monastic life, towards the end of this life unexpectedly finds in some lonely place a vessel chosen by the impartial God, despised in the eyes of men, extolled and exalted by God. Thus, Zosimus found in the uninhabited Transjordan desert, beyond all expectation, the great Mary of Egypt. In view of the great scarcity of spirit-bearing guides, the books of the fathers constitute the only source to which a soul, exhausted by hunger and thirst, can turn to obtain the knowledge essentially necessary for the spiritual struggle. These books are the most precious heritage left by the Holy Fathers to us paupers, their spiritual descendants. These books are the crumbs which have fallen to us and constitute our share, crumbs from the spiritual table of the fathers who were rich in gifts of the Spirit. It is remarkable that the time of writing of a great number of the books on mental prayer coincides with the time of the special decline of mental prayer in the monasteries. When St. Gregory the Sinite, who lived in the 14th century, arrived on Mount Athos, he found there among the thousands of monks only three who had some understanding of mental prayer. Most of the writings on the prayer of Jesus belong to the 14th and 15th centuries. 
moved by secret divine inspiration, writes St. Paisius Velichkovsky. Many fathers expounded in books the holy teaching filled with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit on this divine mental prayer, based on the divine scriptures of the Old and New Covenants. This was arranged by the special providence of God, so that the divine activity should not pass into final oblivion. Many of these books, by God's permission for our sins, were destroyed by the Moslems who conquered the Greek Empire, but by divine economy some have been preserved till our time. Chapters on Mental Prayer, St. Paisius Velichkovsky The most sublime mental activity is extraordinarily simple. It needs for its acceptance childlike simplicity and faith. But we have become so complicated that it is just this simplicity which is inaccessible, incomprehensible to us. We want to be clever. We want to revive our own ego. We cannot bear self-renunciation or self-denial. We have no desire to live and act by faith. It is for this reason that we need a guide to lead us out of our complexity, out of our cuteness, out of our cunning, out of our vanity and self-confidence, into the breadth and simplicity of faith. That is why it frequently happens that in the field of mental activity the child attains phenomenal success, while the learned man loses his way and falls into the dark pit of delusion. In ancient times, writes St. Paisius Velichkovsky, the most holy work of mental prayer shone in many places where the Holy Fathers lived, and there were then many guides for this spiritual labor. That is why, when the Holy Fathers of those times wrote about it, they explained only the unspeakable spiritual profit which is derived from it. There was no need, I suppose, to write about that part of the work which belongs to beginners. They wrote to some extent even about that, which is very clear for those who have experimental knowledge of the subject but for those who have not, it remains veiled. When some of the fathers saw that true and undiluted guides of this work had begun to be very scarce, then moved by the Spirit of God, in order that the true teaching on the elementary stages of this mental prayer should not be lost, they expounded in writing the actual beginning, ways, and exercises, how beginners must train themselves to enter with the mind into the land of the heart, and there truly and without delusion perform prayer with the mind. Chapters on Mental Prayer Chapter 4 We have seen that the Holy Prophet David invites all the people of God without exception to prayer in the name of the Lord. St. Basil the Great, Archbishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia, ruled that for the illiterate and those who do not know sacred scripture by heart, all the written prayers should be replaced by the prayer of Jesus. And this was accepted as a rule by the whole Eastern Church. St. Simeon, Archbishop of Salonica, orders and advises bishops, priests, monks, and lay people at all times and at every hour to offer this sacred prayer and to make it, as it were, the breath of their life. In the service of monastic profession, when the newly professed monk or nun is given the prayer rope, the officiant says, Receive, brother, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Carry it on thy lips, in thy mind, and in thine heart, and say unceasingly, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. But St. Neil Sorsky teaches that the remembrance of God, that is, mental prayer, is above all activities, that it is the queen of virtues like the love of God. He who shamelessly and audaciously wants to amount to God and converse with Him directly, who strives to acquire Him within Himself, will be easily killed by demons if it is allowed as one who has audaciously and proudly sought to attain to what is above his merit and spirituality. This means that all Christians can and should practice the prayer of Jesus for the purpose of repenting and calling upon the Lord for help, with faith and the fear of God, with the greatest attention to the thought and words of the prayer, and with contrition of spirit. In this way, not only monks living in monasteries and engaged in obediences, but lay people as well, can and should practice the prayer of Jesus. Such attentive prayer can be called both mental and cordial as performed frequently with the mind alone and in those who pray diligently always with the participation of the heart which expresses itself in a sense of sorrow and tears of compunction. Saint Neil Sorsky, basing himself on the teaching of the Holy Fathers, forbids people to strive prematurely for the union of the mind with the heart for the leading down of the mind into the heart, 
for exterior and interior silence, for the feeling of devotion or sweetness, and other high states of prayer. These are revealed when God accepts the prayer of penitence, and the enemies retreat from the soul. Said the psalmist, Depart from me, all ye that work vanity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord hath received my prayer. Psalms 6, 7-8 Consolation, comfort, joy, and other spiritual gifts are consequences of reconciliation. To seek them before reconciliation is an undertaking fraught with indiscretion. Preparation for the Art of Arts this should consist in a thorough study of the monastic life by experience and in training oneself for action according to the commandments of the gospel. Since holy prayer is based on a state of soul produced by action according to the commandments, it depends on that state and cannot exist in the soul when the soul is not in that state. Finally, the preparation should consist in a thorough study of the New Testament and the writings of the fathers on prayer. The last preparation is all the more indispensable, since, owing to the lack of spirit-bearing directors, our sole guide must be the writings of the fathers in prayerful weeping before God. Very desirable is the prayer of the heart. Very desirable is the silence of the heart. Very desirable is it to remain perpetually enclosed in one's cell, and to live in the most isolated desert, as these conditions are particularly favorable for the prayer of the heart and silence of the heart. But these very blessings and magnificent works, says St. Nilsorsky, must be practiced with discretion and judgment at the right time when we have attained the due measure of progress, as Basil the Great says. Every work must be preceded by judgment. Without discretion, even a good work is turned into an evil one by being untimely or excessive. But when the time and measure of the good work are determined with discretion, then a wonderful gain ensues. And St. John of the Latter, borrowing the words from Scripture, says, There is a time for everything under heaven, Ecclesiasticus 3, 1. And among all things, he says, in our holy life as well, there is a time for every occupation. And continuing, he says, There is time for silence, and a time for unriotous talk. There is a time for unceasing prayer, and a time for honest service. Let us not be deluded by proud zeal, and seek before the time what comes at a fixed time. Otherwise, even in due time, we shall receive nothing. There is a time to sow labors, and a time to reap the harvest of ineffable grace. In particular, St. Neil forbids an injudicious striving for solitude. Such striving nearly always makes its appearance in persons who understand neither themselves nor monasticism. It is because of this that the most serious self-deception and stumblings occur in solitude. If it is forbidden for monks to strive prematurely for prayer offered by the mind in the temple of the heart, still more is it forbidden for lay people. St. Andrew the Fool and a few others, extremely few lay people, had the most profound prayer of the heart. This is an exception and the greatest rarity which cannot possibly serve as a rule for all. To class oneself among those exceptional personalities is nothing but self-deception due to conceit hidden delusion prior to obvious delusions. Paisius Velichkovsky, in a letter to Elder Theodosius, says, The books of the fathers, especially those of them which teach true obedience, vigilance of mind and silence, attention and mental prayer, that is, prayer performed by the mind and the heart, are intended only for the monastic order and not for all Orthodox Christians in general. The God-fearing fathers, in expounding the teaching on this prayer, affirm that its beginning and its unshakable foundation is true obedience, from which is born true humility, and humility guards him who labors in prayer from all the delusions which dog the self-directed. But it is quite impossible for lay people to acquire true monastic obedience and perfect denial of the will and reason and everything. So how can lay people without obedience, by self-correction which is accompanied by delusion, force themselves to such an awful and terrifying work, that is, to such prayer, without any kind of guidance. How will they be able to escape the diverse and varied illusions of the enemy most cunningly directed against this prayer and those who practice it? So terrible is this thing, that is, prayer, not simply mental prayer, which is prayer performed by the mind, 
inartistically, but prayer that acts artistically with the mind and the heart, that even those who are truly obedient and who have not only renounced but have completely mortified their own will and judgment before their fathers, true and most experienced guides to the work of this prayer, are in constant fear and trembling, fearing and trembling, lest they shall suffer from some kind of delusion in this prayer, although God always protects them from it for their true humility, which they have acquired by the grace of God by means of their true obedience. How much more will lay people living without obedience be in danger of falling into some kind of delusion if they force themselves to this prayer merely from reading books of this kind? This happens to those who begin the labor of this prayer on their own. St. Paisius Velichkovsky writes, The saints called this prayer the art of arts. Who then can learn it without an artist, that is, without an experienced guide? This prayer is the spiritual sword given us by God for slaying the enemy of our souls. This prayer shone like the sun only among monks, especially in the lands of Egypt, likewise in the lands of Jerusalem, on Mount Sinai and Nitria, in many parts of Palestine, and in many other places, but not everywhere, as is evident from the life of St. Gregory the Sinite. He went over the whole of the holy mountain, Mount Athos, and having made a diligent search for practicers of this prayer, he did not find a single one who had the least conception of this prayer. Hence it is clear that if in such a holy place St. Gregory did not find a single person practicing the prayer, in many places the practice of this prayer was unknown among monks. But where it was practiced, where it shone like the sun among monks, there the practice of this prayer was guarded as a great and unutterable secret, known only to God and its practicers. To lay people, the practice of this prayer was completely unknown. But now, since the publication of the books of the fathers, not only monks know about it, but all Christians as well. That is why I fear and tremble, lest, for the reason mentioned above, that is, through entering upon the work of this prayer on their own without a guide, such independent and self-directed souls may expose themselves to delusion, from which may Christ our Savior deliver all who wish to be saved by His grace. Life and Writings of the Moldavian Elder Paisius Velichkovsky Optina Hermitage Edition, 1847 Teaching of Saints Barsanufrius, Dorotheus the Russian, and Seraphim Saint Barsanufrius, a monk who reached the highest degree of spiritual proficiency, also led his disciples into the sanctuary of grace-given prayer of the heart and to the levels of spirituality which are the fruit of it. Among his instructions is the following, given to a hermit under his direction. May the one sinless God who saves those who trust in him strengthen your love to serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of your life. In the temple and altar of the inner man where spiritual sacrifices are offered to God, gold, incense, and myrrh, where the fatted calf is slain, where the precious blood of the Immaculate Lamb is sprinkled, where the harmonious shouts of holy angels re-echo, then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Psalms 50, 20. Then, when, when our Lord comes, that great high priest who offers and receives the bloodless sacrifice, when in his name the lame man sitting at the beautiful gates is granted to hear the joyful voice, rise and walk. Acts 3, 6. Then the lame man enters the sanctuary, walking and leaping and praising God. Then the sleep of negligence and ignorance ceases. Then the drowsiness of sloth and despondency is whisked from the eyelids. Then the five wise virgins light their lamps and rejoice with the bridegroom in the holy bedchamber, singing in harmony silently, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that hopeth in him. Psalms 33, 8 Then conflicts, pollutions, and movements cease. Then is established the holy peace of the Holy Trinity. The treasure is sealed and remains secure. Pray that you may realize and attain it, and rejoice in Jesus Christ our Lord. St. Barsanufius, Answer 115 The greatest reverence for contemplative prayer of the heart is inspired by the sublime descriptions of it in the writings of the Fathers. We need this reverence and real vision in order to renounce all premature, self-willed, proud, imprudent striving to enter the secret sanctuary. And reverence and wisdom teach us to wait with attentive prayer, the prayer of penitence at the doors of the temple. Attention and contrition of spirit, that is the waiting room that is given as a haven to penitent sinners. It is the forecourt of the sanctuary, 
There let us hide and shut ourselves from sin. Let all suffering from moral or spiritual lameness, all lepers, all the blind and withered, in a word, all who are sick with sin, come to that Bethesda and wait for a movement of the water. John 5, 3 The action of the mercy and grace of God. And the one Lord himself, at a time known to him, will grant healing and the entry into the sanctuary solely according to his inscrutable will. I know whom I have chosen, says the Savior, John 13:18. Ye have not chosen me, he says to his chosen, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. John 15:16. Extremely good is the method of practicing the prayer of Jesus taught by Dorotheus, the Russian ascetic and spiritual writer. He who prays with the lips, he says, but neglects his soul and does not guard his heart, prays to the air and not to God. And he labors in vain, because God attends to the mind and fervor and not to prolixity. One should pray with all one's fervor, with one's soul and mind and heart, with the fear of God and with all one's strength. Mental prayer does not allow either distractions or foul thoughts to enter the inner sanctum. Do you wish to learn to pray with the mind and heart? I will teach you. At first, you should make the prayer of Jesus with your voice, that is, with your lips, tongue, and speech, aloud by yourself. When the lips, tongue, and senses are satisfied with prayer pronounced vocally, then vocal prayer stops, and it begins to be said in a whisper. After this, one should contemplate with the mind and always regard and attend diligently to the feeling in the throat. Then, mental prayer of the heart constantly begins to rise automatically by the nod of God and begins to be carried about and act at all times, during every kind of work, in every place. The blessed elder, Hiramang Seraphim Sarov, orders the beginner, according to a previously existing general custom in Sarov Monastery, to make unceasingly the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. During prayer, teaches the elder, attend to yourself, that is, collect your mind, and unite it with your soul. At first, for a day or two or more, make this prayer with the mind alone, slowly, attending to every word separately. When the Lord warms your heart with the warmth of His grace and unites you in one spirit, then this prayer will flow within you unceasingly and will always be with you, delighting and nourishing you. And that is exactly what the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah mean. The dew which is with thee is healing for them. Isaiah 26.19 But when you contain within you this food of the soul, that is, converse with the Lord, why go from cell to cell of the brethren, even though you are invited by someone? Truly, I tell you, idle talking is love of idleness. If you do not understand yourself, can you discuss anything or teach others? Be silent. Constantly be silent. Remember always the presence of God and His name. Do not enter into conversation with anyone, but at the same time, beware of judging those who talk and laugh. In that case, be deaf and dumb. Whatever people say about you, let it all go past your ears. As a model for yourself, you can take Stephen the New, whose prayer was unceasing, conduct, meek, mouth, silent, heart, humble, spirit, contrite, body and soul, pure, virginity, spotless, poverty, true, and detachment, eremitic. His obedience was unmurmuring, his activity, patient, his labor, fervent. When sitting at table, do not look to see and criticize how much anyone eats, but attend to yourself and feed your soul with prayer. Instruction 32 Bishop Ignatius Brianchaninov also notes that very few receive the union of the mind with the heart, as described above, soon after starting the work of prayer. Usually many years pass before that takes place. We must prove the sincerity of our will by perseverance and patience. Having given this instruction to a beginner, leading an active life in monastic labors, and having taught him an exercise of prayer suitable to an active person, the elder forbids a premature and injudicious striving for the contemplative life and for the prayer corresponding to that life. Everyone, he says, who wishes to live a spiritual life must begin with the active life, 
and afterwards pass to the contemplative, because without the active life it is impossible to come to the contemplative. The active life serves to purify us from sinful passions and leads us to a degree of active perfection, and in this way it opens for us the way to the contemplative life. Only those who have been purified from the passions and have had a thorough training in the active life can proceed to the contemplative life. This can be seen from the words of sacred scripture, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And from the words of St. Gregory the Theologian, Only after their experience in the active life can the more perfect proceed to contemplation. One should approach the contemplative life with fear and trembling, with contrition of heart and humility, with much searching of Holy Scripture, and under the direction of a skilled elder, if such can be found, and not with presumption and self-confidence. An audacious and scornful man, according to the words of Gregory the Sinite, having sought a high spiritual state for which he is not fit, conceitedly strives to attain it prematurely. And again, if anyone dreams by his own mind to attain a high state and has acquired a satanic and not a true desire, him the devil catches in his nets as his servant. St. Gregory the Sinite, Instruction 29 While thus warning against a proud striving for a high state of prayer, the elder insists on the necessity for all monks in general, including the most elementary novices, of a recollected life and unceasing prayer. It has been observed that for the most part that tendency which is accepted on his entry into the monastery remains dominant in a monk for the whole of his life. Only those who have interior prayer and watch over their souls receive the gifts of grace, affirms St. Seraphim. Those who have truly resolved to serve God must practice the remembrance of God and unceasing prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ, saying with the mind, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. By this practice, while guarding oneself from distraction and while maintaining peace of conscience, one can draw near to God and be united with Him. Other than by unceasing prayer, according to the words of St. Isaac the Syrian, it is impossible to draw near to God. Instruction 11 To avoid distraction and remain recollected, St. Seraphim advises monks and novices who wish to practice the prayer of Jesus to stand in church during the services with closed eyes and to open them only when oppressed by sleep and drowsiness. Then he advises them to direct their gaze towards the holy icons, which also prevents distraction and stimulates prayer. A beginner can learn the prayer of Jesus with special ease during the long monastic services. When present at them, what is the use of fruitlessly and harmfully allowing one's thoughts to wander everywhere? But this is impossible to avoid, and thus the mind is fixed on something. Busy yourself with the prayer of Jesus. It will prevent the mind from wandering. You will become far more recollected, more deeply concentrated. You will attend much better to the church reading and singing. And at the same time, in an imperceptible manner, you will gradually train yourself in mental prayer. St. Seraphim orders one who desires to live a recollected life not to attend to irrelevant rumors which fill the head with vain and idle thoughts and memories, and not to pay attention to the affairs of others, not to judge them, and not even to think or speak about them. He orders such a person to avoid conversations, to behave like a pilgrim or stranger, to bow in silence to fathers and brothers whom one happens to meet, and to guard oneself from looking attentively at them. Instruction 6 because such looking cannot fail to produce in the soul some kind of impression which will cause distraction by drawing away the attention and diverting it from prayer. Generally speaking, one living a recollected life should not stare at anything and should not listen to anything with special diligence, but should see as if without seeing and hear as if in passing, so that the memory and power of attention may be always free, immune to the impressions of the world, apt and ready to receive the divine impressions. The Method of St. John of the Ladder It is evident that the methods proposed by the monk Dorotheus and the elder Seraphim are identical with the method proposed by St. John of the Ladder. But St. John has expounded his method with special clarity and precision. This father is among the most ancient and greatest of the guides of monasticism and is recognized as such by the universal church. Later holy writers refer to him as a most reliable teacher, as a living vessel of the Holy Spirit. 
On these grounds we offer his method with complete confidence to beloved fathers and brothers, not only those living in monasteries, but also those living in the midst of the world who have an honest desire to pray sincerely, successfully, and in a way pleasing to God for general use. This method is indispensable. To dispense with the method would be to dispense with attention. But without attention, prayer is not prayer. It is dead. It is useless, soul-harming babbling, offensive to God. He who prays attentively cannot fail to pray more or less by this method. If the attention grows and increases during prayer, the method of prayer offered by the divine John will certainly make its appearance. Ask with tears, he says. Seek with obedience. Knock with patience. In this way, every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh shall it be opened. Matthew 7, 8 Experience will soon show that in using this method, especially at first, the words should be pronounced with extreme unhurriedness so that the mind may have time to enter the words as into forms. This cannot be done when the reading is hurried. St. John's method is very convenient, both when practicing the prayer of Jesus and when reading the ordinary prayers in one's cell, and even when reading the scriptures in patristic books. One must train oneself to it as if one were reading by syllables, with the same unhurriedness. He who has become proficient in this method has acquired oral, mental, and cordial prayer, suitable for anyone living an active life. The Most Holy Kadistos, Patriarch of Constantinople, delivers the following judgment on prayer. Unceasing prayer consists in an unceasing invocation of the name of God, whether talking, sitting, walking, making something, eating, or occupied in some other way, one should at all times and in every place call upon the name of God, according to the command of Scripture, pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. In this way the enemy's attempts upon our life are foiled. We must pray with the heart. We must also pray with the mouth when we are alone. But if we are in the market or in the company of others, we should not pray with the lips, but only with the mind. We must keep watch over our sight and always look down to guard ourselves from distraction and the enemy's snares. Prayer has reached perfection when it is offered to God without the mind's wandering into distraction, when all a person's thoughts and feelings are gathered into one prayer. Prayer and psalmody should be performed not only with the mind, but with the mouth too, as the prophet David says, O Lord, thou shalt open my lips, and my mouth shall declare thy praise. Psalms 50.15 and the apostle, showing that the mouth is required as well, said, Let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Hebrews 13.15 To a monk who asked him how to pray, St. Barsanufius the Great replied, We should exercise ourselves in psalmody to some extent, and pray vocally to some extent. We also need time to examine and observe our thoughts, he who at dinner has many different foods eats much and with pleasure, whereas he who uses every day the same food not only eats it without pleasure, but sometimes perhaps even feels repelled by it. So it is in our state. In psalmody and prayer do not bind yourself, but do as much as the Lord gives you. Do not abandon reading and interior prayer either. Some of one and some of the other, and so you will spend the day pleasing God. Our perfect fathers did not have a fixed rule, but during the course of the whole day they carried out their rule. They exercised themselves in psalmody to some extent, to some extent prayed orally, to some extent examined their thoughts, and they even gave a little time and thought to food, but they did all this with the fear of God. Answer 177. That is how a holy father who had become very proficient in prayer instructed a brother. Experience will teach everyone who practices prayer that the saying aloud of a few prayers of Jesus and all prayers in general is a great help in preventing the mind from being robbed by distraction. In the event of a violent attack of the enemy, when a weakening of the will and darkening of the mind is felt, vocal prayer is indispensable. Attentive vocal prayer is at the same time both mental and cordial. By our poor word, we are not preventing or deterring our beloved fathers and brothers from imminent success in prayer. On the contrary, we desire it with all our heart. May all monks be like angels and archangels 
who have no rest day or night from the divine love which stimulates them and are therefore incessantly and insatiably satisfied with glorifying God. For the very reason that the priceless wealth of the prayer of the heart that is a gift of grace may be received in its time, we forbid and warn our reader against striving for it prematurely, from proudly considering yourself worthy and fit to receive it, and thereby depriving yourself of it. This striving is forbidden, because the discovery in oneself of the prayer of grace by one's own efforts is impossible. This striving which crashes furiously against the gates of the mystical temple of God is forbidden in order that it may not prevent the mercy of God from eventually having mercy on us, and regarding the unworthy as worthy, and giving the gift to those who were not expecting the gift, having doomed themselves to eternal torments in the prisons of hell. The gift is given to those who humble and abase themselves before the greatness of the gift. The gift is given to those who renounce their own will and surrender themselves to the will of God. The gift is given to those who subdue and mortify their flesh and blood, who subdue and mortify the mind of the flesh by the commandments of the gospel. Life dawns and rises according to the degree of our mortification. It comes unexpectedly, entirely at its own good pleasure, and then it completes and perfects the mortification begun voluntarily. Careless, especially self-willed, proud, and self-directed seekers of a high state of prayer are always sealed with the seal of rejection, with the precision of spiritual law. Matthew 22, 12-14 The removal of that seal is very difficult, mostly impossible. Why? Because pride and self-confidence, which lead to self-deception, to fellowship with demons and enslavement of them, do not allow us to see the wrongness and peril of our positions. Do not allow us to see our woeful fellowship with the demons, nor our disastrous fatal enslavement to them. Clothe yourself first with leaves, and then, when God commands, bring the fruits, said the fathers. St. Barsanufius the Great and John the Prophet answered 325. First acquire attentive prayer. To one purified and prepared by attentive prayer, trained and qualified by the commandments of the gospel and grounded on them, God, the all-merciful God, will give in his time the prayer of grace. God is the teacher of prayer. True prayer is the gift of God. Ladder 2864 To him who prays constantly with contrition of spirit, with the fear of God and with attention, God himself gives gradual progress in prayer. From humble and attentive prayer, spiritual action and spiritual warmth make their appearance and quicken the heart. The quickened heart draws the mind to itself and becomes a temple of grace-given prayer and a treasury of the spiritual gifts which are procured by such prayer as a matter of course. Labor away, say great ascetics and teachers of prayer, with pain of heart to obtain warmth in prayer, and God will grant you to have them always. Forgetfulness expels them, and it is born of sloth and carelessness. Saints Barsanufius and John Answers 264, 274, and 273. If you want to be delivered from forgetfulness and captivity, you will not be able to attain it otherwise than by acquiring within you the spiritual fire. Only from the warmth of the fire of the Spirit do forgetfulness and captivity vanish. This fire is obtained by desire for God. Brother, unless your heart seeks the Lord day and night with pain, you will not be able to succeed. But if you abandon everything else and occupy yourself with this, you will attain it. As Scripture says, Be still and know. Psalms 45.10 Brother, implore the goodness of him who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2.4 To give you spiritual vigilance which kindles the spiritual fire. The Lord of heaven and earth came to earth to pour that fire upon it. See Luke 12.49 According to my power, I shall pray with you that God, who gives grace to all who ask with fervor and toil, may grant you that vigilance. When it comes, it will guide you to the truth. It enlightens the eyes, directs the mind, banishes the sleep of languor and negligence, restores luster to the weapon covered with rust and the earth of sloth, restores radiance to clothes defiled by captivity to barbarians inspires a desire to be satisfied with the great sacrifice offered by our great high priest. 
this sacrifice of which it was revealed to the prophet that it cleanses sins and takes away iniquities. See Isaiah 6, 7. Forgives those who weep and gives grace to the humble. See Proverbs 3, 34. Manifests itself in the worthy and by it they inherit eternal life in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spiritual vigilance or sobriety is a spiritual art which completely delivers a man with the help of God from sinful actions and passionate thoughts and words when fervently practiced for a considerable time. It is silence of heart. It is guarding of the mind. It is attention to oneself without any other thought which always incessantly and unceasingly calls upon Jesus Christ, the Son of God and God, which breathes by him, with him courageously takes up arms against the enemies and which confesses him. This is the definition of spiritual vigilance that St. Hezekiah of Jerusalem gives on sobriety or vigilance, chapters 1 and 35, the Philokalia. The rest of the fathers agree with him. When the fire descends into the heart, says St. John of the Ladder, it revives prayer. And when prayer has risen and ascended to heaven, then the descent of the fire takes place into the cynicle of the soul. The latter, 28.45. It is evident that the saint is speaking from his own blessed experience. Something similar happened in the case of St. Maximus Capsocalavites. From my youth, he told St. Gregory the Sinite, I had great faith in my lady, the mother of God, and besought her with tears to grant me the grace of mental prayer. Once I came to her temple as usual and fervently prayed to her for this. I went up to her icon and reverently kissed her image. Suddenly I felt as if there fell into my breast and heart a warmth which did not burn, but bedewed and delighted me and stirred my soul to compunction. From that moment my heart began to say the prayer within itself, and my mind began to delight in the remembrance of my Jesus and the Mother of God and to have him, the Lord Jesus, constantly within itself. Since then the prayer has never ceased in my heart. Philokalia the prayer of grace appeared suddenly, unexpectedly, as a gift from God. The saint's soul had been prepared to receive the gift of prayer by fervent, attentive, humble, constant prayer. The prayer of grace did not stay in the saint without its usual concomitants, quite unknown and uncongenial to the carnal and natural state. An abundant manifestation of spiritual fire in the heart, the fire of divine love, is described by George, the recluse of Zadonsk, from his own experience. But before that, he was sent the divine gift of penitence which purified his heart to receive love, the gift which acts like fire and consumes all that defiles the courts of the holy and mighty Lord, and even took all the strength from his body. The holy and heavenly fire, says St. John of the Ladder, scorches some on account of their defective purity, but others it enlightens as having attained perfection. The same fire is called a consuming fire and an illuminating light, for this reason, some leave their prayer as if it were a hotly heated bathhouse, feeling a certain relief from defilement and earthliness, while others go out shining with light and arrayed in a double garment of joy and humility. But those who, after prayer, feel neither of these two effects are still praying bodily and not spiritually. The latter, 2851. Prayer inspired by divine grace is here called spiritual prayer while prayer performed by one's own efforts without the obvious assistance of grace is called bodily prayer. The latter kind of prayer is indispensable, as St. John of the Ladder says, in order that grace-given prayer may be granted in its time. But how does the prayer of grace intimate its coming? It intimates its coming by supernatural weeping, and the man enters the gates of God's sanctuary, his heart, with unspeakable thankfulness. Higher Levels of Prayer before coming to a description of the method offered by the Holy Fathers almost exclusively to those living in silence, we consider it necessary to prepare the reader somewhat. The writings of the Fathers may be compared to a chemist's shop in which are quantities of the most healing remedies. But a sick man unacquainted with medical science and without a doctor for a guide will find it very difficult to select a medicine suitable to his illness. But if out of self-confidence and thoughtlessness in the absence of a doctor, without properly consulting medical books, the sick man hurriedly decides on the choice of a medicine himself. That choice can be most unfortunate. A medicine in itself curative can prove not only useless but even very harmful. 
we are in a position similar to that of the sick man, owing to the absence of spirit-bearing guides in regard to the writings of the Holy Fathers on the mystical action of the prayer of the heart and its consequences. The teaching on prayer in those books of the Fathers that have come down to us is expounded with satisfying fullness and clarity. But being placed in our ignorance before these books, in which are described in the greatest variety the activities and states of beginners, intermediates, and proficients, we find it extremely difficult to choose states and activities suitable for us. Unspeakably happy is he who feels and realizes this difficulty. Through not realizing it, after a superficial reading of the Holy Fathers and having become superficially acquainted with the activities proposed by them, many have taken upon themselves an activity unsuited to them and have done themselves harm. St. Gregory the Sionite See the article, How to Sing in Philokalia. In his article written for the extremely advanced Hesychus Longinus says, The work of silence is one thing, and life in community is another. Everyone who continues in the life to which he is called will be saved, and therefore I am afraid to write on account of the weak, knowing that you live among them. For whoever adopts an excessively strenuous labor of prayer from hearsay or study perishes through having no director. The Holy Fathers remind us that many who undertake the work of prayer wrongly by methods for which they were unready or unfit fall into self-delusion and mental derangement. The greatest harm comes not only from reading the books of the Fathers with insufficient understanding, but even from associating with the greatest of God's saints and from hearing their holy teaching. That is what happened to the Syrian monk Malpat. He was a disciple of St. Julian. In the company of his elder, St. Julian, Malpat visited St. Antony the Great and heard from him the most sublime teaching on the monastic life, on self-mortification, on mental prayer, on purity of soul, on vision. Without properly understanding his teaching, burning with material heat, Malpat laid upon himself the severest labor and began to live as a strict recluse in the hope of attaining that high spiritual state of which he had heard from Antony the Great and which he had seen and touched in Antony the Great. The result of his effort was the most fearful self-deception. Corresponding to his violent effort, there was formed a violent delusion, while the conceit which seized the unfortunate man's soul rendered him incapable of repentance, and so of healing. Malpat became the inventor and head of the heresy of the Eukites. Oh, sad event! Oh, most sad spectacle! A disciple of a great saint after hearing the teaching of the greatest of saints, through wrongly putting their teaching into practice, perished. He perished in those times when, on account of the hosts of saints able to direct and heal, very few souls were lost through delusion. This is said as a warning to us. When countless lights existed, the way of interior monasticism, mystical prayer in solitude, and the silence of the mind and the heart was recognized as a way beset with dangers. How much more perilous is this way, now that the dark night has come? Dense clouds and fog hide the heavenly lights. One must travel extremely slowly, groping one's way. The study of the patristic books provided by divine providence as the moral guidance for contemporary monasticism is no trifling enterprise. In order to succeed in it, self-renunciation is necessary. The abandonment of worldly cares is necessary, not to mention diversions, amusements, and pleasures. It is necessary to live according to the commandments of the gospel. Necessary, too, is purity of mind and heart by which alone the spiritual, holy, and mystical teaching of the Spirit can be discerned and understood according to the degree of one's purification. Let him who has learned that at the present time the treasure of salvation and Christian perfection is hidden in the words uttered by the Holy Spirit or under his influence, that is, in sacred scripture and the writings of the Holy Fathers, rejoice spiritually that he has obtained really useful knowledge. Let him hide completely from the world in a pious life. Let him go and sell all that he hath and buy that field, see Matthew 13.44, in which is hidden salvation and perfection. To make a thorough study of scripture with corresponding practice, considerable time is necessary. After a thorough study of Scripture, with the greatest caution, constantly asking God's help by prayer and weeping, in poverty of spirit, one may even attempt those activities which lead to perfection. A certain holy monk said of himself, 
that he studied the writings of the fathers for twenty years while leading the ordinary life of a monk in community. At the end of that time, he decided to become practically acquainted with the profound monastic activity, a theoretical knowledge of which he had acquired by reading, and probably, as was possible at that time, from conversations with proficient fathers. The progress of a monk by the guidance of reading is incomparably slower than by the guidance of a spirit-bearing director. What is written by every holy writer is written from his spiritual attainment and from his experience in conformity with his level and practice. We must pay special attention to this point. Let us not be carried away and enraptured by a book written as if with fire that tells of high states and activities for which we are unfit. The reading of such a book, by firing the imagination, can harm us by communicating a knowledge of and desire for labors that are untimely and impossible for us. Let us apply ourselves to the book of a father nearer to our state in the matter of attainment. With this view of patristic books, one may offer as the first reading of a monk who desires to become acquainted with the work of interior prayer, the instructions of St. Seraphim Asarov, and the works of Paisius Velichkovsky and his friend, the monk of the great habit Basil. The holiness of these persons and the soundness of their teaching is undoubted. After studying these writings, one can turn to the book of St. Neosorsky. This book is small in format, but its spiritual scope is extraordinarily comprehensive. It would be difficult to find a question on mental activity which is not solved in it. Everything is explained with quite extraordinary simplicity and clarity in a most satisfying manner. The method of practicing the prayer of Jesus is similarly explained, but both the method and the whole book are intended for monks capable of living in silence. St. Gregory the Sinite In the morning, says St. Gregory, quoting the wisdom of Solomon, sow thy seed, that is, prayer, and in the evening let not thy hand cease, lest the constancy of prayer, broken by intervals, should lose that hour in which it might be heard. For thou knowest not which may spring up. Ecclesiasticus 11, 6 In the morning, sit on this stool the height of his span, and lead your mind down from your head into your heart, and hold it there. Bending forward painfully, and having much pain in the chest, neck, and shoulders, unceasingly cry with the mind or soul, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And restrain your breathing somewhat, so as not to breathe carelessly. On silence in fifteen chapters, chapters two and three. Regarding the teaching that the breathing should be checked, the Sinai quotes Saints Isaiah the Solitary, John of the Latter, and Simeon the New Theologian. If we wish unerringly to find the truth and know it, says the Sinai, let us endeavor to have solely the action of the heart. It must be completely imageless and we must on no account give freedom to the imagination or allow the fancy to form an image of any saint or light, because usually delusions, especially at the beginning of the work, deceive the minds of the inexperienced with false fantasies of this kind. Let us strive to have in an active heart only the action of prayer which warms and gladdens the mind and inflames the soul to unutterable love for God and man. Then observable humility and contrition makes its appearance from the prayer, because prayer in beginners is the ever-moving mental action of the Holy Spirit. This action at the beginning is like a fire that flares up in the heart, but at the end it is like a fragrant light. By beginners is meant here beginners in silence or hesychasm. In fact, the whole of St. Gregory the Sinite's book is intended for the instruction of hesychasts. Again, the Holy Sinite says, Some teach that the prayer should be said vocally, others with the mind alone. But I recommend both ways. For sometimes the mind gets exhausted in saying the prayer from tedium, and sometimes the mouth wearies of doing so. Therefore we should pray with both, with the mouth and with the mind. Yet we must call upon the Lord quietly and without disturbance, so that our voice may not distract the senses and the attention of the mind and interrupt the prayer. When the mind gets used to this work, it will receive strength from the Spirit to pray vigorously and in all ways then there will be no need to say the prayer orally, and it will even be impossible. He who has attained to this will be fully satisfied with mental prayer. The Philokalia, instruction to Hesychasts how to say the prayer.
In recommending vocal prayer from time to time, St. Gregory combines his method with that of St. John of the Ladder. In substance, it is the same rule, but St. Gregory speaks of it in his well-known degree of proficiency. He who diligently practices St. John of the Ladder's method will in due time reach that state of prayer of which the Sinite speaks. Prayer, according to the Sinite's very sound and practical opinion, must be accompanied especially by patience or perseverance. The hesychast should mostly sit for the practice of prayer on account of the difficulty of this labor, and sometimes, for a short time, he may even lie on his bed in order to give the body some respite. Your sitting should be in patience to fulfill the command that we must continue in prayer, Colossians 4, 2, and not soon stop and give up on account of the extremely heavy labor of the mental invocation and the constant immersion of the mind in the heart. Thus the prophet says, Pains have seized me like those in travail, Jeremiah 8.21. But bend your head down, and gather your mind into your heart, if your heart has opened to you, and invoke the help of the Lord Jesus. Feeling pain in the shoulders and often afflicted with headache, endure this with perseverance and zeal, and seek the Lord in your heart. For the kingdom of heaven is the inheritance of those who force themselves, and those who force themselves take it by force. Matthew 11.12 the Lord has shown that true diligence consists in the endurance of these and similar pains. Patience and waiting in every activity is the parent of pains of body and soul. The word pain here mostly means contrition of spirit, the weeping or mourning of the spirit, its pain and suffering from the realization of its sinfulness, from the realization of eternal death, from the realization of its slavery to fallen spirits. The suffering of the spirit is communicated to the heart and the body, as they are inseparably bound up with the Spirit in such a way that there is a natural necessity for them to participate in its states. For those who are weak physically, contrition of spirit, weeping, and mourning fully take the place of bodily toil. St. Isaac the Syrian, chapter 89. But for people of strong constitution, the discipline of the body is indispensable. In their case, without the discipline of the body, the heart will not acquire that blessed peace which is born in the weak, from the realization and recognition of their weakness. St. Gregory writes, No bodily or spiritual activity without pain or toil ever brings fruit to him who practices it, because the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Matthew 11.12 By violence, understand a sense of bodily pain in all you do. Many have labored for many years and still labor painlessly. Yet because they have no patience for toil or fervor of heart for pain, they fail to acquire purity and the Holy Spirit through their refusal of the austerity of pain. For those who work carelessly and slackly apparently toil greatly, but they never gather fruit because they take no pains and are fundamentally painless. A witness to this is he who says, Whatever great struggles we may have endured, if we have not acquired a suffering heart, they are counterfeit and useless. The latter, 764. The great Saint Ephraim testifies to the same thing, saying, While toiling, toil painfully, in order to avoid the painfulness of vain labors. For if, according to the prophet, our loins are not rifled with the pain of fasting, and if pangs do not take hold of us as the pangs of a woman in travail, we shall not conceive the spirit of salvation on the earth of our heart. Isaiah 21.3 and 26.18 let us not merely boast of our living in a barren desert and of our idle quiet, thinking ourselves to be something on this account. At the time of our departure, we shall all know for certain the whole fruit of our life. On Quiet and Prayer, Philokalia, paragraph 14. The teaching of St. Gregory the Sinite on the painfulness which accompanies the true activity of a hesychist mental prayer may seem strange as it has seemed strange to the carnal and natural mind unacquainted practically with the monastic life. We invite such people to turn their attention to the evidence obtained by experience, and we testify that not only the activity of mental prayer, but even the attentive reading of deep patristic writings on the subject will produce headache. Contrition of heart on account of one's sinfulness is so powerful that it will produce in the body pains and sufferings, the very existence of which, and even the possibility of their existence, is quite unknown to those unacquainted with the labor of prayer. 
When the heart confesses to the Lord its sinfulness and its wretched state, then the body is crucified. I have been wretched, says David, experienced in the labor of prayer, and utterly bowed down until the end. All the day long I went with downcast face, for my loins are filled with mockings, and there is no healing of my flesh. I am afflicted and humbled exceedingly. I have roared from the groaning of my heart. Psalms 37, 6-8 What is particularly remarkable in the teaching of St. Gregory is that he insists that the mind must concentrate on the heart. This is what the fathers call the artistic activity of prayer, which they forbid to beginners, both monks and laymen, who need considerable preparatory training. And even prepared monks must approach this artistic activity with the greatest reverence, fear of God, and caution. In ordering that the mind should be concentrated on the heart, the saint adds, If your heart has opened... This means that the union of the mind with the heart is a gift of divine grace, granted in its time at God's discretion, but not at any time, and not at the discretion of the ascetic. The gift of attentive prayer is usually preceded by special sufferings and upheavals of the soul which lead our spirit down into the depth of the realization of its poverty and nothingness. St. Isaac the Syrian, chapter 78. The gift of God is attracted by humility and fidelity to God, expressed by the resolute rejection of all sinful thoughts at their very appearance. Fidelity is a cause of purity. To purity and humility are entrusted the gifts of the Spirit. Luke 16, 10-12 St. Nicephorus of Mount Athos The artistic activity of mental prayer is explained with special clarity and fullness by Blessed Nicephorus, a monk who practiced silence on holy Mount Athos. He rightly calls this work of prayer the art of arts and science of sciences, since it provides the mind and heart with knowledge and impressions which are infused directly by the Spirit of God, whereas all other sciences supply merely human knowledge and impressions. Mental activity is the highest school of theology. This greatest of great activities, says the great director of Hesychasts, is acquired by many, or even all, through learning. Occasionally, without learning, people receive it from God by strenuous labor and warmth of faith. But this is an exception, not the rule. Therefore, it is necessary to look for an undiluted director in order to learn from his instruction to distinguish the right and left deficiencies and superfluities in the work of attention that are due to the instigation of the evil one. From the very fact that the director has suffered and been tempted himself, he will be able to explain to us what is required and will truly show us the spiritual way, which we shall therefore easily accomplish. If there is no director at hand, we must seek him without regretting the labor. But if, after such a search, he is not to be found, after calling upon God in contrition of spirit and with tears, and after praying to him earnestly with humility, do what I tell you. You are aware that our breathing by which we live is an inhaling and exhaling of air. The organs that serve for this purpose are the lungs which surround the heart. They pass air through themselves and flood the heart with it. Thus, breathing is the natural way to the heart. And so, collect your mind and conduct it by way of your breathing by which air passes to the heart and together with the inhaled air force it to descend into the heart and to stay there. And train it not to come out of there quickly, for at first this inner enclosure and restraint is very wearisome. But when it becomes accustomed to it, Then, on the contrary, it does not like whirling about, because it is there filled with joy and happiness. Just as, when a man who has been away from home returns, he forgets himself for joy that he is again with his wife and children, embraces them and cannot stop talking to them, so, too, the mind, when it is united to the heart, is filled with unutterable joy and sweetness. Then it sees that the kingdom of heaven is truly within us, for it now sees it within itself, and as it seeks with pure prayer to stay and be strengthened in it, it regards all outward things as repulsive and hateful. When you enter the place of the heart, as I have shown you, give thanks to God, and, while glorifying His goodness, always maintain this activity. It will teach you what you will never learn in any other way. And you should also know that when your mind is established in the heart, it must not remain there silent and idle, but must unceasingly make the prayer Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. This prayer, by holding the mind without dreaming, 
renders it inaccessible and immune to the appeals of the enemy, and daily leads it more and more into love and longing for God. But if after laboring much, brother, you cannot enter the domain of the heart as I have told you, do as I shall further tell you, and with God's help you will find what you are seeking. You are aware that the power of speech, or the reasoning faculty, is located in the breast. For within the breast, when our mouth is silent, we speak, deliberate, say prayers, sing psalms, and so on. And so, having driven out of it every thought, for you can if you want to, make this faculty of speech say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And force it to cry within the breast, instead of any other thought, only this. If you do this for some time, the entry into the heart will be open to you without any doubt, as I have already written, having learned it from experience. And with much yearning and sweet attention, there will also come to you a whole host of virtues, love, joy, peace, and the rest, on account of which your every wish will be fulfilled through Jesus Christ our Lord. Philokalia, Profitable Discourse on Sobriety or Vigilance. Here, in the first place, we should notice the spirituality of the Blessed Father and the spirituality which he saw in the monk whom he was instructing. This may be seen in the sections of his article which precede the exposition of the art. There it is evident from the reference to the life of St. Saba that the teaching on silence of the heart, for which and in connection with which outward silence of the body is procured, is suitable for those monks who have been fully trained in the rules of the monastic life. To the person he is instructing, St. Nicephorus says, You are aware that the power of speech is located in the breast. For within the breast, when the mouth is silent, we speak, deliberate, say prayers, sing psalms, and so on. Very few have a clear sense of the power of speech in their breast so as to be able to pray and sing psalms in their heart. This is the gift of those who have made considerable progress, who have practiced the prayer for a long time according to the method of St. John of the Latter, who have acquired a considerable degree of concentration, and by very attentive prayer, have aroused their spirit to abundant sympathy with the mind. In people in their ordinary state, the spirit, struck by the fall, sleeps an unwakeable sleep identical with death. It is incapable of the spiritual exercises indicated here, and awakes for them only when the mind is constantly and persistently occupied in rousing it by means of the life-giving name of Jesus. The method suggested by St. Nicephorus is excellent. In his exposition of it, for one who understands the matter, it is clear that one must prepare for it gradually, and at the same time that its acquisition is the gift of God. As this method is explained in particular detail in the works of Xanthopolis on prayer and silence, we shall pass to his writings. St. Callistus Xanthopolis St. Callistus Xanthopolis was a disciple of St. Gregory the Sinite, and spent his monastic life on Mount Athos. He was first trained for the monastic life in a community. Later, when he seemed ready for it, he passed to the life of a hesychast. He learned mental prayer while in obedience to the cook of the monastery. He also had secular learning. This may be clearly seen from the books written by him. Towards the end of his life, he was raised to the rank of Patriarch of Constantinople. St. Ignatius was his closest friend and the sharer of his monastic labors. Both attained great proficiency in prayer. Their book, included in the Philokalia, in directions to hesychasts, was written exclusively for hesychasts. To the technique expounded by St. Nicephorus, they add that in using it the mouth should be closed. They say that a beginner in the hesychast life should practice the prayer of Jesus by the method of St. Nicephorus and unceasingly lead it into the heart gently by means of breathing through the nose, and that one should exhale equally gently keeping the mouth shut, chapters 19 and 45. It is very important to know the significance which the holy teachers of mental prayer give to the technique offered by them, which, being a material aid, must on no account be confused with the actual operation of the prayer, and to which no special importance should be attached, as if all the success of the prayer depended upon it. In the success of prayer, it is the power and grace of God that is the efficient cause and that accomplishes everything. The aids remain aids, required by our weakness, and are rejected as unneeded and superfluous when success is obtained. To put one's hope and trust in these aids is very dangerous, for it leads to a wrong, material conception of prayer, 
and diverts one from a spiritual understanding of it, which is the only true one. A false understanding or conception of prayer always leads to a fruitless or harmful practice of it. And so, no, brother, say Saints Callistus and Ignatius, that every art and every rule, and, if you wish, every different form of activity, is prescribed and rightly appointed for the simple reason that we cannot yet pray in our heart purely and undistractedly. But when this is accomplished by the will and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, then we abandon the many and diverse and varied, and we are united immediately and ineffably with the one, the single, and the unifying. Chapter 38 By remaining in the art of the pure and undistracted prayer of the heart as explained above, but it can be partly impure and not free from distraction, apparently on account of the thoughts and memories of the past which rise up and hinder it, Bishop Ignatius. The ascetic gradually learns to pray without having to force himself and without wandering purely and truly. That is, he reaches a state in which the mind remains in the heart and is not merely led into it under compulsion and occasionally by way of the breathing and then jumps out again, but it remains there constantly and prays without ceasing. The labor of mental prayer of the heart is accomplished by the mind through its overshadowing with the help of divine grace and through the single thought, heartfelt, pure, unwandering invocation with faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, and not through the one mere natural art of breathing through the nose or through sitting in a quiet and dark place when practicing the prayer. God forbid. This was invented by the Divine Fathers merely as a help to collecting the mind from its usual wandering and to restoring it to itself and to attention. Chapter 24 Before all spiritual gifts, undistraction or concentration is given to the mind by our Lord Jesus Christ and the invocation in the heart of His holy name with faith. This is assisted to some extent by a natural art which aids the leading down of the mind into the heart by means of breathing through the nose. Sitting in a quiet and darkish place is also helpful, and other aids of this kind. Chapter 24 Saints Callistus and Ignatius strictly forbid all premature striving for what, according to the spiritual system of the monastic life, has its own appointed time. They wish a monk to act in the order appointed for him, according to the laws taught by divine grace. And you, they say, who desire to learn the silence that leads to heaven, wisely follow the appointed laws, and in the first place, embrace obedience gladly, then silence. Just as action is a step to contemplation, so obedience is the portico to silence. Pass not beyond the ancient bounds which thy fathers have set, says Scripture, Proverbs 22:28. Woe to him that is alone, Ecclesiastes 4:10. Thus, Having first laid a good foundation, you will be able eventually to put a most glorious roof on the Spirit's architecture. Just as all is rejected when the beginning is unskillful, so, on the contrary, when the beginning is skilled, all is beautiful, although the opposite also sometimes happens. Chapter 14 It is generally recognized that until the acquisition of concentration, that is not illusory or brief, but constant and real, It is useful to practice the prayer of Jesus in monastic company while furthering the practice of the prayer with the practical carrying out of the commandments of the gospel or with what amounts to the same thing, humility. After receiving the gift of concentration, it is permitted to undertake silence. That is how Saints Basil the Great and Gregory the Theologian acted. According to Saint Isaac the Syrian, they at first occupied themselves with the fulfillment of those commandments which concern people living in human society and practiced prayer that corresponded to that state. From this life their mind began to feel stillness and concentration. Then they withdrew into the solitude of the desert, where they engaged in activity in the inner man, and attained contemplation. St. Isaac the Syrian, Chapter 55 To practice perfect silence in our time is very difficult, almost impossible. St. Seraphim Asarov, Ignatius Nikiforovsky, and Nikander Babayevsky monks who were extremely proficient in mental prayer, lived sometimes in silence and sometimes in community. The last, in particular, never withdrew into silence perceptible to men, though in soul he was a great hesychast. The way of silence by which St. Arsenius the Great was directed has always been excellent and now must be acknowledged to be the best. This father constantly observed silence, 
did not go to the brother's cells, received visitors into his own cell only in cases of extreme necessity, stood in church somewhere behind a column, did not write and did not receive letters, in general withdrew from all contacts that could disturb his attention, and had as the aim of his life and all his actions the preservation of attention. Alphabetical Patrology and Memorable Sayings of St. Arsenius the Great The way of life and silence by which St. Arsenius attained great proficiency is highly praised and recommended for imitation by St. Isaac the Syrian as an extremely easy, wise, and fruitful way. St. Isaac the Syrian, Chapter 41 As a conclusion to our extracts from the works of St. Callistus and Ignatius, let us quote their experienced opinion, which agrees with the opinion of other Holy Fathers, that to acquire unwandering prayer of the heart, much time and much effort are needed. To pray constantly within the heart, they say, and even higher states than that, are attained not simply, as if by chance, not by means of a little labor and time, though even that occurs occasionally by the inscrutable providence of God. But it requires a long time, and no little labor, a struggle of body and soul, much and prolonged exertion. On account of the excellence of the gift and the grace of which we hope to partake, there must be, according to our power, equal and corresponding labors, in order that, according to the mystical and sacred doctrine, the enemy may be expelled from the ranges of the heart, and Christ may be manifestly instated there. Says St. Isaac, Let him who wishes to see the Lord endeavor artistically to purify his heart with the remembrance of God, and in this manner, by the clarity of his thought, he will hourly see the Lord. And St. Barsanufius, if interior activity by the grace of God does not help a man, he will labor in vain exteriorly. Interior activity, combined with anguish of heart, brings purity, and purity brings true silence of the heart. By such silence, humility is secured, and humility makes a man a dwelling of God. But when God dwells in a man, then the demons and passions are driven out, and the man becomes a temple of God, rifled with sanctification, filled with illumination, purity, and grace. Blessed is he who sees the Lord in the innermost treasury of his heart as in a mirror, and with weeping pours out his prayer before his goodness. St. John Carpathios Much time and labor in prayer is necessary in order to find in poise of mind another heaven of the heart where Christ dwells. As the Apostle says, Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? 2 Corinthians 13, 5 Material Aids With these excerpts from the Holy Fathers, we shall content ourselves, since they satisfactorily explain the work of the prayer of Jesus. In the other patristic writings the same teaching is given. We consider it necessary for our beloved fathers and brethren to repeat the warning that they should not be in a hurry to read the writings of the fathers on the most exalted monastic states and activities, though love of knowledge draws one to such reading, though such reading produces ecstasy and delight. Our freedom, according to the nature of the time, must be particularly limited. When there were spiritual directors, then the attachments of beginners were easily noticed and cured. But now there is no one to cure or even to notice the attachments. Often a pernicious attachment is taken for great progress by inexperienced directors. The attached person is spurred on to greater attachment. An attachment which has started to act on a monk without being noticed continues to act and to draw him further and further from the true course. It will be no mistake to say that the majority of people have some kind of attachment. Those who have renounced their attachments are very few, while people who have never been attached simply do not exist. Therefore, now that the patristic books have become our sole means of direction, we should read them with special care and caution, lest our one means of direction should be turned into a source of wrong activity and the confusion that results from it. Let us seek, says St. John of the Latter, concerning the choice of a director, not such as have the gift of foreknowledge and spiritual insight, but rather such as are unquestionably humble and whose character and place of residence correspond to our maladies. The Latter, 4. 120. The same must be said about books, too, as we have already said above. We should, on no account, choose the most exalted and sublime, but rather those that are near to our state, and which explain the activity proper for us. It is a great evil, said St. Isaac the Syrian, 
to teach some high doctrine to one who is still in the rank of beginners and in spiritual stature is still an infant. Chapter 74 The carnal and natural man, on hearing spiritual guidance, understands it in conformity with his state, twists and distorts it, and by following it in his distorted sense, takes a wrong course and holds to it stubbornly, as a course given by holy guidance. A certain elder reached Christian perfection by the special providence of God after entering silence contrary to the rules in his youth. At first he lived in silence in a forest in Russia, living in a mud hut, and afterwards on Mount Athos. After his return to Russia, he lived in a community in an unsubsidized monastery. Seeing in the elder the undoubted signs of sanctity, many of the brethren went to him for advice. The elder gave instructions from his own experience and did harm to the souls of the brethren. A monk who knew the elder well said to him, Father, you speak to the brothers about activities and states which are beyond their understanding and experience. The result is that they interpret your words in their own way. Acting in accordance with that interpretation, they do themselves harm. The elder replied with holy simplicity, I see that myself, but what am I to do? I regard all as higher than myself, and when they ask, I reply from my own experience. The common or general monastic way was unknown to the elder. Not only sin is fatal for us, but good is also fatal when we do it not at the proper time or not in due measure. Thus, not only is a famine fatal, but also excess of food or a quality of food that does not suit our age or constitution. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Matthew 9.17 The Lord said this of the acts of virtue which must unfailingly agree with the state of the doer. Otherwise they will ruin the doer and will perish themselves. That is, they will be undertaken fruitlessly, and will harm and ruin the soul, which is the exact opposite of their purpose. Besides the aids explained above for the assistance of beginners in the practice of the prayer of Jesus, there are also various other aids. We shall enumerate the chief of them. Number 1. Echotki or Listovka Echotki usually consists of a hundred pips or beads, while a Listovka consists of a hundred steps, since in the rule performed with the prayer of Jesus the prayers are usually counted by the hundred. The Chotki is used to count prostrations, and also monks sit and practice the prayer of Jesus at first by the Chotki. But when through prayer attention increases, it becomes impossible to pray by a Chotki and count the prayers. Then the whole attention is absorbed in the prayer. Number two. It is very useful to train oneself to the prayer of Jesus by performing it with prostrations and bows to the waist, making them unhurriedly and with a sense of penitence as the blessed youth George made them, of whom St. Simeon, the new theologian, tells in his article on faith, the Philokalia. Number three. In church, and in fact generally when practicing the prayer of Jesus, it is useful to keep the eyes closed. Number four. It is also helpful to hold the left hand on the chest over the left nipple of the breast, a little above it. This technique helps one to feel the power of speech which is in the breast. Number five. The fathers advise Hezekiah to have a somewhat dark room or cell with curtained windows to keep the mind from distraction and to assist it to concentrate in the heart. Number six. Hezekiahs are advised to sit on a low stool, firstly because attentive prayer requires a restful position, and secondly, after the example of the blind beggar mentioned in the Gospel, who sat on the roadside and cried to the Lord, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, Mark 10.47, and was heard and healed. Also, this low stool represents the dunghill on which Job sat outside the city when the devil struck him from head to foot with a terrible disease. See Job 2.8. A monk should see himself crippled, deformed, torn by sinfulness, cast out of his natural state by it, cast down to what is unnatural, and from his wretched state he should cry to the all-merciful and almighty Jesus, Have mercy on me. The low stool is very convenient for the practice of the prayer of Jesus. This does not mean that standing is banned, but, as nearly all the time of a true hesychast is devoted to prayer, 
he is allowed to engage in it sitting down, and sometimes even in a lying posture. Especially the sick and elderly should beware of excessive bodily exertion, so as not to exhaust their powers and make it impossible for them to engage in spiritual labor. The essence of the work is in the Lord and in His name. The paralytic was let down on his bed before the Lord through the roof of the house and received healing. Healing is attracted by faith and humility. Number 7. Those who practice mental activity sometimes have to pour cold water on themselves or apply towels soaked in water to the places where there is blood congestion. The water should be at summer temperature and on no account very cold as the latter only increases the heat. Generally speaking, mental occupations tend to produce fever in certain constitutions. Abba Dorotheus felt a fever of this kind when he was studying science and that is why he cooled himself with water. Holy Abba Dorotheus, Meditation 10 Fever of this kind must certainly be felt by those who force themselves much to the union of the mind with the heart by means of material aids and give them excessive importance and fail to give due importance to spiritual aids. In the case of special material exertion to acquire the prayer of the heart, a warmth begins to act in the heart. This warmth is the direct result of such an effort. Every member of the human body that is subjected to friction gets heated. The same thing happens in the case of the heart under long and constant strain. The warmth which appears as a result of vigorous material exertion is also material. It is a warmth of the flesh and blood in the realm of our fallen nature. An inexperienced ascetic, on feeling this warmth, will unfailingly think it is something wonderful and will take pleasure and delight in it, and that is the beginning of self-deception. Not only should we not think anything special of this warmth, but on the contrary, we should take special precautionary measures as soon as it makes its appearance. Precaution is necessary because this warmth, being of the blood, not only passes to different places in the breast, but can also very easily drop to the lower parts of the stomach and cause there the most violent excitement and burning. It is natural that carnal desire should then begin to act, for that is characteristic of those parts in a state of excitement. Some who have reached this state and have not understood what was happening to them have given way to confusion, to despondency, to despair, as is known from experience. Regarding their state as desperate, they had recourse to famous elders and sought in their advice a cure for their souls, tortured with doubt and misery. Hearing that at the invocation of the name of Jesus there had appeared the most violent burning combined with the action of lust, the elders were horrified at the devil's wiles. They saw here a terrible delusion. They ordered the sufferers to stop the practice of the prayer of Jesus as the cause of this evil. They told many other ascetics about this phenomenon as a remarkable and disastrous consequence of the practice of the prayer of Jesus, and many believed their judgment out of respect for the elders' renowned name. They believed that their judgment was the fruit of actual experience. Actually, this terrible delusion is merely a congestion of the blood brought about by a violent, ignorant use of material aids. This congestion can be easily cured in two or three days by applying to the inflamed parts linen soaked in summer water. Far more dangerous, far nearer to delusion is it when the ascetic feels this natural warmth in his heart or breast and takes it for a gift of grace, thinks of it, and therefore of himself, as something, begins to imagine delight for himself, to darken, deceive, enmesh, ruin himself with conceit. The more bodily exertion and effort an ascetic makes, the more violently the warmth of the blood is increased, and so it ought to be. In order to moderate this warmth and prevent its falling down, no special effort should be made to press the mind into the heart. The heart should not be overworked, and heat should not be produced by excessive holding of the breath and straining of the heart. On the contrary, the breathing must be checked gently, and the mind must be led into union with the heart very gently. We should try to ensure that the prayer acts in the very summit of the heart where the power of speech resides according to the teaching of the fathers and where divine worship should therefore be performed. When divine grace overshadows the labor of prayer and begins to unite the mind with the heart, then material blood warmth completely vanishes. Then the sacred action of prayer undergoes a great change. It becomes, as it were, natural, perfectly light and free. Then there appears in the heart another warmth, subtle, immaterial, spiritual, 
which does not produce any excitement or burning. On the contrary, it cools, illumines, bedews, refreshes, and acts as a healing, spiritual, soothing unction, and it induces unutterable love for God and men. That is what St. Maximus Capsocalavitis says of this warmth from his own blessed experience, the Philokalia. The Danger of Delusion I offer fathers and brothers my poor advice, begging them not to reject my poor advice. Do not force yourself prematurely to the discovery within yourself of the action of the prayer of the heart. Prudent caution is most necessary, especially in our time, when it is almost impossible to find a satisfactory guide in these matters, when the ascetic must himself force his way gropingly by the direction of the writings of the Holy Fathers to the treasury of spiritual knowledge, and also must gropingly select for himself what is suited to his needs. While living according to the commandments of the Gospel, attentively practice the prayer of Jesus according to the method of St. John of the Latter, combining prayer with weeping, having as the beginning and end of prayer repentance. In its own time, known to God, the action of the prayer of the heart will be revealed of itself. Such action, revealed by the touch of the finger of God, is more excellent than that which is acquired by vigorously forcing oneself by means of material aids. It is more excellent in many respects. It is far more extensive and voluminous, far more abundant. It is quite safe from delusion and other dangers. He who receives in this way sees in what he receives only the mercy of God, a gift of God, while he who attains by the vigorous use of material aids, though seeing the gift of God, he cannot fail to see his own effort and labor, he cannot fail to see his own mechanical aid which he has used, he cannot fail to ascribe to it special importance. This in the subtle way of the Spirit is a considerable defect, a considerable obstacle, a considerable hindrance to the development of spiritual proficiency. For the development of spiritual proficiency there is no end, no limits. An insignificant, unnoticed hope or trust in something outside God can stop the advance of progress and proficiency in which faith in God is leader, guide, legs, and wings. Christ for the believer is all, said St. Mark, Spiritual Law, Chapter 4. Of those who have used with special diligence the material aids, very few have attained success, but very many have deranged and harmed themselves. With an experienced director, the use of the material aids incurs little danger, but with the guidance of books it is very dangerous, since it is so easy, through ignorance and imprudence, to fall into delusion and other kinds of spiritual and bodily disorder. Thus, some, on seeing the harmful consequences of indiscreet labor, and having only a superficial and confused idea of the prayer of Jesus and the circumstances that accompany it, attributed these consequences not to ignorance and imprudence, but to the most holy prayer of Jesus itself. Can anything be sadder and more disastrous than this blasphemy, this delusion? In teaching the prayer of the heart, the Holy Fathers did not say exactly in which part of the heart it ought to be performed, probably because in those times there was no need for such instruction. St. Nicephorus says, as of something well known, that the power of speech is located in the breast, and that when this faculty is aroused to participation in the prayer, the heart is also aroused to such participation. It is difficult for those who know something thoroughly in all its details to foresee and anticipate with a solution all the questions and problems that may arise from complete ignorance. Where ignorance sees darkness, knowledge finds nothing obscure. In latter times, a vague reference to the heart in the patristic writings caused great perplexity and a wrong practice of prayer in those who, without a director and without studying with due care the writings of the fathers, on the basis of superficial ideas snatched from a hasty reading, decided to engage in the artistic prayer of the heart, putting all their hope and trust in the material aids to its practice. A definite explanation of this subject has therefore become indispensable. The human heart has the shape of an oblong bag which widens upwards and narrows towards the base. It is fastened by its upper extremity, which is opposite the left nipple of the breast, but its lower part, which descends towards the end of the ribs, is free. When shaken, this shaking is called the beating of the heart. Many, having no idea of the arrangement of the heart, think that their heart is where they feel its beating. 
in undertaking on their own the practice of the prayer of the heart and in trying to lead their breathing into their heart, they direct it to just that part of the heart and cause carnal excitement there. Then, when this greatly increases the beating of the heart, they invite it to themselves and thrust on themselves a wrong state and delusion. The monk Basil and the elder Paisius Velichkovsky say that many of their contemporaries harmed themselves by misusing material aids, and in latter times cases of derangement caused in this way were frequently met. In fact, they are met even now, although the disposition to practice the prayer of Jesus has decreased almost to the vanishing point. One is bound to meet them. They are the inevitable consequence of ignorant, self-directed, conceited, premature and proud zeal, and finally of a complete lack of experienced directors. The monk Basil, referring to St. Theophylact and other fathers, affirms that the three powers of the soul, the power of speech or reason, the power of fervor and the power of desire are disposed thus. The power of speech, or the spirit of the man, is present in the breast and in the upper part of the heart. The power of fervor in the middle part and the power of desire or natural cupidity in the lower part. He who tries to set in motion and warm the lower part of the heart sets in motion the power of cupidity, which on account of the nearness to it of the sexual parts and on account of their nature sets in motion those parts. The most violent burning of carnal desire follows an ignorant use of a material aid. What a strange phenomenon! An ascetic, apparently, engages in prayer, but the occupation produces lust, which it ought to mortify. And ignorance, having misused a material aid, ascribes to the prayer of Jesus what it ought to ascribe to misuse. The prayer of the heart springs from the union of the mind with the spirit, which were separated by the fall and are united by the grace of redemption. In the human spirit are concentrated feelings of conscience, humility, meekness, love for God and one's neighbor, and other similar properties. During prayer, the action of these properties needs to be united with the action of the mind. All one's attention should be directed to this end. This union is effected by the finger of God, who alone can heal the wound of the fall. But the practicer of prayer shows the sincerity of his will to receive healing by his constant perseverance in prayer by shutting his mind in the words of the prayer and by exterior and interior activity according to the commandments of the gospel, which render the spirit capable of union with the mind of the person praying. In addition to this, the artistic direction of the mind towards the seat of speech in the upper part of the heart helps to some extent. Generally speaking, excessive exertion in the use of this material aid is harmful as it arouses material warmth. Warmth of flesh and blood should have no place in prayer. On account of its soul-saving effect upon us of prayer in general, and of the remembrance of God or the prayer of Jesus in particular, as means to remaining in constant union with God and to constantly repulsing the attacks of the enemy, engagement in the prayer of Jesus is especially hateful to the devil. Those who pray in the name of the Lord Jesus are liable to special persecution by the devil. All the labor and all the care of our adversary, says St. Macarius the Great, consists in trying to divert our thought from the remembrance of God and from love for him. To this end he uses the charm of the world and draws us away from the true good to false, unreal goods. Word 1, 3 and Word 2, 15 Therefore, he who has consecrated himself to the true service of God must specially guard himself against letting his thoughts wander by the unceasing prayer of Jesus, and must on no account allow himself to be mentally idle. Without paying any attention to the thoughts and images that make their appearance, he must constantly return to prayer by the name of Jesus, as to a harbor or haven, believing that Jesus indefatigably takes care of that servant of his, who keeps near him constantly by the unwearying remembrance of him. The wicked demons, says St. Nilus the Sinite, at night try to disturb the spiritual workers themselves, but during the day they do so through men by surrounding him with calumnies, adversities, and mishaps. On prayer, chapter 139, Philokalia. This order in the satanic struggle is soon observed in actual experience by every practicer of prayer. The demons tempt by thoughts, by mental images, by the remembrance of the most needed objects, by reflections on apparently spiritual subjects, by rousing anxiety and worry and various fears and apprehensions, and by other manifestations of unbelief. In all the varied conflicts of the demons, 
A sense of disturbance or agitation always serves as a true sign of the approach of fallen spirits, even though the action produced by them has an appearance of justice. To ascetics living in solitude and praying vigorously, devils appear in the form of monsters, in the form of tempting objects, sometimes in the form of radiant angels, martyrs, saints, and even Christ himself. One should not fear the threats of the devils, and towards all apparitions in general, one should maintain an attitude of extreme incredulity. In such cases, which, however, are rare, our foremost duty is to have recourse to God, to surrender ourselves wholly to His will, and to ask for His help. We should pay no attention to the apparitions, and not enter into relations or conversation with them, regarding ourselves as unfit to deal with hostile spirits, and unworthy to converse with holy spirits. Human Opposition a true God-pleasing ascetic of prayer is liable to special afflictions and persecutions from his fellow men, and in this, as we have already said, the chief actors are demons. They use as their tools those persons who have made their activity one with the activity of the demons, and also those who do not understand the fiendish conflicts and therefore easily become the devil's tools, and even those who understand the enemy's cunning but are not careful enough or attentive to themselves, and so let themselves be deceived. The most striking and horrible example of the terrible hatred for God, for the Word of God and for the Spirit of God with which men can be infected, whose spirit and outlook has become one with that of the demons, we see in the Jewish high priests, elders, scribes, and Pharisees, who committed the greatest of all human crimes, deicide. St. Simeon the New Theologian says that, by the instigation of devils, monks leading an insincere life envy true ascetics, and do all in their power to disconcert them or expel them from the community. Even well-intentioned monks, who, however, live an outward life and have no conception of the interior life, take offense at spiritual workers, consider their conduct strange, condemn and slander them, and insult and persecute them in various ways. A great practicer of the prayer of Jesus, the blessed elder Seraphim Asarov, suffered through the ignorance of his brother monks and their carnal view of monasticism because those who read the law of God bodily think they can fulfill it with outward actions alone without spiritual labor, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. 1 Timothy 1, 7 St. Mark the Ascetic, Spiritual Law, Chapter 34 St. Seraphim instructs and comforts us, drawing the instruction and comfort from his own spiritual experience with this. In following the way of the interior contemplative life, we must not give in and abandon it because people who are attached to what is outward and sensible oppose our heart's most cherished convictions with their opinions and do all they can to divert us from living an interior life by putting all kinds of obstacles in our way. No opposition must deter us from going this way, but we must take our stand on the word of God. We shall not fear their fear nor be alarmed, for God is with us. We shall sanctify the Lord our God, by the heartfelt remembrance of his divine name, and he shall be our fear. Isaiah 8, 10-13 Instruction 29 When St. Gregory the Sinite arrived on Mount Athos and began to share his God-given knowledge with pious ascetics who were fervent and intelligent, but understood the service of God only in a bodily manner, at first they strongly opposed him. So strange does the doctrine of spiritual labor seem to those who have no idea of it and are unaware of its existence, and who give to bodily labor undue importance. Still stranger does mental activity seem to the carnal and natural mind, especially when it is infected with the blight of conceit and the poison of heresy. Then the hatred of the human spirit, which has entered into alliance with Satan against the Spirit of God, expresses itself with unnatural fury. In order to make this clear and show in vivid relief how pervertedly the carnal and natural mind understands everything spiritual and distorts it to conform with the darkness of the fall in which it gropes, despite its earthly learning, we shall relate briefly here the slanders and calumny against mental activity of the Latin monk Barlam and certain Western writers. Bishop Innocent, in his History of the Church, says that Barlam, a Calabrian monk in the 15th century, arrived in Salonika, a town of the Eastern Greek Empire. There, in order to act on behalf of the Western Church under cover of orthodoxy, he renounced Latinism. Having written several works to prove the rightness of the Eastern Church, 
He thereby won the praise and trust of the emperor Cantacuzini. Realizing that Greek monasticism was the mainstay of the church, he wanted to weaken it and even crush it so as to shake the whole church. With this object, he expressed a desire to live the strictest monastic life and craftily persuaded an Athenite hermit to reveal to him the artistic practice of the prayer of Jesus. Having got what he wanted, but having understood what had been revealed to him in an absurd and superficial manner, Barlaam took for the unique essence of the matter a material aid which the fathers, as we have seen, call merely a certain help and spiritual visions for material visions seen only with the bodily eyes. This he reported to the emperor as a serious error. A council was convoked in Constantinople. St. Gregory Palamas, an Athenite monk and a great practiser of mental prayer, entered into controversy with Barlaam, and by the power of the grace of God defeated him. Barlaam and his blasphemies were anathematized. He returned to Calabria and Roman Catholicism. But many Greeks who were superficial Christians believed his doctrine and brought it to the West where his blasphemies and absurd calumnies were accepted as a confession of the truth. The historian Fleury, in describing Barlaam's teaching, concentrates the whole activity of mental prayer in a material aid and so distorts it. Fleury makes an extract on technique from St. Simeon the New Theologian's Three Ways of Prayer, contained in the Philokalia, and affirms that Simeon teaches that one should sit in a corner of one's cell, direct one's eyes and the whole of one's thought towards the center of the stomach, that is, towards the navel, hold one's breath even by the nose, and so on. It would be hard to believe that the learned and talented Fleury had written such nonsense if it did not appear for all to see on the pages of his history. Volume 6, Book 95, Chapter 9 Bergier, another extremely learned and talented author, says that Greek monks, through striving for contemplation, went mad and became fanatics. In order to reach a state of ecstasy, they fixed their eyes on their navel and held their breath. Then they imagined they saw a gleaming light, and so on. In distorting and ridiculing the way of prayer practiced by true contemplatives, the Latins do not hesitate to ridicule states of grace produced by prayer, do not hesitate to ridicule the action of the Holy Spirit. Let us leave the libels and blasphemies of heretics to the judgment of God. With a feeling of sorrow and not of condemnation, let us turn our attention away from such nonsense. Let us listen to what our blessed exponent of the prayer of Jesus, Seraphim Asarov, says of the vision of the light of Christ. In order to receive and see in one's heart the light of Christ, we must withdraw ourselves as much as possible from visible objects. Having purified our soul by penitence, good works, and faith in him who was crucified for us, we should close our bodily eyes and immerse our mind and our heart, where we should cry with the invocation of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then, according to the measure of his zeal and fervor of spirit for the Beloved, a man finds delight in the name pronounced which arouses desire to seek higher enlightenment. When through this exercise the mind tarries in the heart, then there dawns the light of Christ which sanctifies the temple of the soul with its divine radiance, as the prophet Malachi says, To you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise. Malachi 4.2 This light is at the same time life, according to the word of the gospel. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 1, four, Instruction 12 From this it is clear that, contrary to the view of Barlaam and the Latins, this light is not material but spiritual, and that it opens the eyes of the soul and is seen by them, although it also acts on the bodily eyes, as it did in the case of the Holy Apostle Paul, see Acts 9. St. Macarius the Great, in explaining in detail and with special clarity the doctrine of this light, in his seventh word, says that, it is a substantial shining of the power of the Holy Spirit in the soul. Through this light all knowledge is revealed, and God is truly known by the worthy and beloved soul. Word 7.23 In agreement with St. Macarius are all the Holy Fathers who have learned Christian perfection by experience and who have described it in their writings with a description as adequate as that indescribable mystery allows in the realm of matter. It is very useful to know that a fruit of pure, unwandering prayer is the renewal of our nature, and that our renewed nature is adorned and endowed with gifts of divine grace. But the striving to acquire these gifts prematurely, a striving by which, through the instigation of pride, God's will for us is forestalled, is extremely harmful and leads only to delusion. 
It is for this reason that all the fathers speak very briefly about the gifts of grace, but speak very fully on how to acquire pure prayer of which the gifts of grace are fruits. The work of prayer requires assiduous training, but the gifts of prayer appear of themselves as properties of our renewed nature when, after its purification by penitence, that nature is sanctified by the overshadowing of the Spirit. St. Paisius Vedichkovsky, who lived at the end of the 18th century, wrote a treatise on mental prayer to refute the blasphemies of a certain earthly-minded monk philosopher who lived on the Moshinsky Mountains and was a contemporary of Paisius. In our days, writes Paisius in a letter to the elder Theodosius, a certain monk, an earthly-minded philosopher, seeing that some with zeal for this prayer, though not according to knowledge, fell into delusion through their independence or the ignorant guidance of directors inexperienced in this prayer, instead of blaming the independence and unskilled direction, attacked and blasphemed this holy prayer, and incited by the devil, attacked it to such an extent that they far surpassed even the ancient thrice-cursed heretics Berlam and Akindinus. Neither afraid of God nor ashamed of men, he fabricated fearful and shameful blasphemies against this holy prayer and against its devotees and practicers, blasphemies intolerable for the chaste human ear. Over and above that, he raised such a tremendous persecution against the advocates of this prayer that some of them left everything and fled to our country and are living a God-pleasing life as solitaries here. But others, being feeble-minded, were driven to such madness by the depraved words of the philosopher that even those who had books of the fathers with them drowned them, as we heard, in a river by tying them to a brick. His blasphemies made such an impression that some directors forbade the reading of the books of the fathers under pain of being deprived of their blessing. Not content with oral blasphemy, the philosopher intended to publish his blasphemies in writing. Then, struck by the rod of God, he became blind. With that, his anti-God campaigns came to an end. However rich it may be in worldly wisdom, the carnal and natural mind always regards mental prayer very suspiciously and unsympathetically. It is a means of union of the human spirit with God, and therefore it is particularly strange and hateful for those who are content for their spirit to remain in the company of rejected and fallen spirits, hostile to God, who are unaware of their fall, who proclaim and exalt the fallen state as if it were a state of the highest progress and proficiency. The word of the cross, preached by the lips of the apostles to all men, is to them that perish foolishness. It remains foolishness when it is preached by the mind to the heart and to the whole being of the old man by prayer. But for those who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18 Greeks who have never known Christianity and Greeks who have returned from Christianity to Hellenism seek in conformity with their spirit wisdom and mental prayer and find foolishness. But true Christians, by the apparently weak and meaningless labor of mental prayer, find Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 1 Corinthians 1, 22-25 It is not surprising that our learned men, too, who had no idea of mental prayer according to the tradition of the Orthodox Church, and who had merely read about it in the works of Western authors, repeated the blasphemies and nonsense of those authors. The spiritual friend of the elder Paisius Velichkovsky mentions other monks of his day who rejected the practice of the prayer of Jesus for three reasons. First, because they considered this practice suitable only for holy and dispassionate people. Secondly, on account of the complete lack of directors. Thirdly, on account of the delusion which sometimes follows mental labor. The groundlessness of these arguments has been examined by us in its place. Ascetic Essays, Part 1 conversation of an elder with his disciple on the prayer of Jesus. Here it will be enough to say that those who reject the practice of mental prayer for these reasons engage exclusively in vocal prayer without even so attaining due proficiency. By rejecting a practical knowledge of mental prayer, they cannot acquire an oral prayer due attention, which is secured preeminently by mental prayer. Psalmody, performed vocally and orally, without attention and with considerable distraction, inevitable in the case of bodily workers who do not keep watch over their mind, acts on the soul very feebly and superficially and produces fruits corresponding to its action. 
Very often, when it is performed with clockwork regularity and in great quantity, it gives birth to conceit and its consequences. Many, says Father Basil, having no practical knowledge of mental activity, erroneously judge that mental activity is suitable only for dispassionate and holy men. For this reason, from outward habit, they keep only to psalmody, troparia, and canons, and doze in this merely outward prayer of theirs. They do not understand that the hymns and prayers that have been handed down to us by the fathers are only for a time, on account of the weakness and childishness of our mind, so that by gradually training ourselves we may mount to the degree of mental activity and not stay till our dying day merely in psalmody. What is even more childish is when we read with our mouth our outward prayer and are carried away by the joyful thought that we are doing something great, consoling ourselves merely with quantity and thereby nourishing the inner Pharisee. Preface to the Book of St. Gregory the Sinite Prayer and Life Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2.19 Commands the Apostle This command refers to all Christians, but it specially refers to those who intend to practice unceasing prayer by the name of the Lord Jesus. The most pure name of Jesus cannot tolerate to dwell in the midst of impurity. It requires that all impurity should be expelled and banished from the vessel of the soul. It enters the vessel according to the degree of its purity, and it at once begins to act in it and effect the further purification for which the man's own efforts were insufficient and which is needed if the vessel is to become a worthy receptacle for the spiritual treasure, a shrine for the most holy name. Let us avoid overeating and even satisfaction. Let us make our rule moderate, constant abstinence in food and drink. Let us deny ourselves the pleasure of tasty foods and drinks. Let us sleep sufficiently, but not excessively. Let us renounce idle talking, laughter, jokes, scoffing. Let us put a stop to unnecessary visits and receptions of brothers in our cell under the pretext of love under which name are screened idle talks and occupations which devastate the soul. Let us renounce daydreaming and vain thoughts which arise within us on account of our unbelief and imprudent worrying, and on account of vainglory, resentment, irritability, and our other passions. With absolute faith, let us rely entirely upon the Lord, and our many thoughts and empty dreams let us replace with unceasing prayer to the Lord Jesus. If we are still surrounded by enemies... Let us cry with strong weeping and mourning to the King of Kings, just as people who have been wronged and persecuted cry out of a crowd. And if we are admitted to the King's inner apartment, let us present our complaint to him and ask his mercy with the greatest quietness and humility from the very depth of our soul. Such prayer is particularly powerful. It is entirely spiritual, expressed immediately to the very ear of the King, to his heart, an indispensable, essential condition of success in the prayer of Jesus is the keeping of his commandments. Continue ye in my love, John 15, 9, he said to his disciples. What does it mean to remain in love for the Lord? It means to remember him unceasingly, to remain unceasingly in union with him in spirit. The former without the latter is dead and cannot even exist. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. John 15.10 If we constantly observe the Lord's commandments, then by our spirit we shall be united with him. If we are united with him in spirit, we shall long for him with our whole being. We shall unceasingly remember him. Direct your actions, all your conduct, by the commandments of the Lord Jesus. Direct your words by them. Direct your thoughts and feelings by them and you will get to know the virtues of Jesus. When you feel within yourself these virtues by the action of divine grace, and when you acquire through these feelings an experimental knowledge of them, you will be ravished by the incorruptible sweetness which is not of this world or age, a gentle but powerful sweetness that annihilates the heart's inclination for all earthly enjoyments and pleasures. Having been ravished by the virtues of Jesus, you will love him, and you will yearn for him to dwell in you completely. Without him, you will regard yourself as perishing and lost. Then you will cry incessantly, cry from the fullness of conviction with all your soul, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
the prayer of Jesus will replace all other prayers for you. And all of them, what thought can they contain and express more comprehensive than the thought of the pardon of sinners by Jesus? Make your one aim in life the doing of the will of Jesus in every circumstance, however important or trifling it may seem. Try to do only what is pleasing to Jesus, and all your actions will be equally worthy of heaven. Love the will of Jesus more than the desires of your flesh, more than your ease and comforts, more than life, more than your soul. As often as possible, read the gospel and learn in it the will of your Lord and Savior. Do not disregard the smallest feature of the gospel, not the least commandment, however unimportant it may seem. Check and mortify all movements of your own, not only the sinful ones, but also the apparently good ones which belong to fallen human nature, often very developed among pagans and heretics who are as far from the virtues of the gospel as the East is from the West. Psalms 102.11 Let all your old men be silent within you. Let Jesus alone act within you by his most holy commandments and by the thoughts and feelings that arise from these commandments. If you live in this way, the prayer of Jesus will certainly blossom within you, quite independently of whether you dwell in the deepest solitude or amidst the noise of a community, because the place of abode and rest of this prayer is the mind and heart renewed by the knowledge, experience, and fulfillment of the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12.2 Life according to the commandments of the gospel is the one true source of spiritual progress, accessible to everyone who sincerely desires to succeed in whatever outward situation he may be placed by the inscrutable providence of God. The practice of the prayer of Jesus by its very nature requires unbroken vigilance over oneself. Reverent care, says St. Seraphim, is needed here because that sea, that is, the heart with its thoughts and desires which must be purified by means of attention, is great and spacious. Therein are things creeping innumerable. Psalms 103.25 That is, many vain, wrong, and impure thoughts, the offspring of evil spirits. Instruction 5 we must keep constant watch over ourselves if we are to prevent sin from stealing in and ravaging our soul. But that is not enough. We must keep constant watch to see that our mind and heart remain in the will of Jesus and follow his holy orders. Otherwise, carnal wisdom may crowd out spiritual wisdom, or we may be carried away by some excitement or heating of the blood. We must try to remain as far as possible in a state of constant deadness, in a kind of fine coolness. See Third Kings 19.12 When this feeling of a fine coolness makes its appearance, then the will of God is seen out of it more clearly and fulfilled more freely. When the will of God is seen more clearly, then hunger and thirst for divine righteousness is aroused with special force and with the profound realization of his poverty. And with weeping, the ascetic tries with renewed efforts to discover that righteousness within himself by the most attentive, most reverent prayer. As this divine prayer, says St. Paisius Felichkovsky, is the highest of all monastic labors, the summit of reparations according to the decision of the fathers, the source of virtues, a most subtle and invisible activity of the mind in the depth of the heart, therefore correspondingly invisible, subtle snares of various delusions and fantasies, scarcely comprehensible for the human mind, are set by the unseen enemy. Svitok, Chapter 4 it is impossible to lay any foundation for prayer by the name of Jesus other than the one laid which is our Lord Jesus Christ himself, the God-man. He incomprehensibly veiled the infinite divine nature with finite human nature, and from the finite human nature he displayed the actions of the infinite God. On account of our childishness, the Holy Fathers teach certain aids, as was said above, to make it easier for us to train ourselves to the prayer of Jesus. These aids are only aids and of no special import. We should not pay excessive attention to them or attribute excessive importance to them. All the power, all the action and effect of the prayer of Jesus is due to the adorable and almighty name of Jesus, the one name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 In order to become capable of discovering this action within us, we must be cultivated by the commandments of the gospel, as the Lord said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
either that which awaits us after our death, or that which is discovered within us during our earthly life. But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 7.21 The proficient need no outward aids. Amidst the turmoil of a crowd, they remain in silence. All the obstacles to spiritual progress are within us, only in us. If anything from without acts as an obstacle, it merely convicts and exposes our feeble will, our duplicity, our corruption by sin. No outward aids would be necessary if we lived as we ought to live. Our life is slack, our will is fickle, our resolution is negligible. And therefore we need outward aids, just as those who have diseased legs need a stick and crutches. The kind-hearted fathers, seeing that I wish to practice the prayer of Jesus, and seeing further that I am fully alive to the world, and that it acts powerfully upon me through my senses, advise me to go into a solitary dark cell for prayer, so that in this way my senses may be rendered inactive, my ties with the world may be severed, and my immersion within myself may be facilitated. They advise me to sit during the practice of the prayer of Jesus on a low stool, so that I may have the bodily position of a beggar asking for alms, and may more easily feel the poverty of my soul. When I attend divine service, and during the service engage in the prayer of Jesus, the fathers advise me to close my eyes to guard me from distraction. That is because my sight is alive to matter, and no sooner do I open my eyes than I at once begin to receive in my mind the impressions of objects that I see which draw me away from prayer. And there are also many other outward aids which were discovered by men of prayer to provide material assistance in mental activity. These aids can be used with profit, but in making use of them we must take into account the spiritual and bodily needs of each person. A mechanical aid which is very good for one ascetic may be useless and even harmful for another. The proficient refuse material aids just as a man healed of lameness throws away his crutch, just as a child on reaching a certain age refuses baby clothes, just as from a finished house the scaffolding is taken away. For all and everyone, it is really useful to begin one's training in prayer by the name of the Lord Jesus, by saying the prayer of Jesus orally while enclosing the mind in the words of the prayer. By the enclosure of the mind in the words of the prayer is meant the strictest attention to those words without which prayer is like a body without a soul. Let us leave it to our Lord himself to transform our attentive oral prayer into mental prayer of the heart and soul. He will do this without fail when he sees us even a little purified, educated, matured, and prepared by the practice of the commandments of the gospel. A prudent parent will not give a sharp sword to his infant son. A child is not in a position to use a sword against an enemy. He will play with a dangerous sword and will lightly and easily pierce himself with it. A child in spiritual growth is unfit for spiritual gifts. He will use them not for the glory of God, not for the benefit of himself and his neighbors, not for defeating unseen foes, but he will use them to strike himself, will become conceited and rifled with fatal pride and ruinous scorn for his neighbors. Even when we have no spiritual gifts and are rifled with stinking passions, we are proud of ourselves and boast, and do not cease to condemn and humiliate our neighbors who in all respects are better than we are. What would have happened if we had been entrusted with some spiritual wealth, some spiritual gift which singles out its possessor from his brethren, and testifies that he is a chosen vessel of God? Would it not have become for us the cause of a terrible spiritual disaster? Let us hasten to perfect ourselves in humility, which consists in a specially blessed state of the heart, and makes its appearance in the heart as a result of doing the commandments of the gospel. Humility is that single altar on which it is allowed us, by spiritual law, to offer the sacrifice of prayer, and on which the offered sacrifice of prayer ascends to God and appears before His face. Humility is that single vessel into which the gifts of grace are put by the finger of God. Let us practice the prayer of Jesus disinterestedly, with simplicity and purity of intention, with penitence as our objective, with faith in God, with complete surrender to the will of God, with hope and trust in the wisdom, goodness, and omnipotence of His holy will. In choosing the mechanical aids, 
Let us try to act with all possible care and prudence, and not allow ourselves to be carried away by idle curiosity or irresponsible zeal, which the inexperienced imagine to be a virtue, but which the Holy Fathers call proud audacity, mad impetuosity. Let us preferably resort to the simplest and humblest aids, since they are the safest. We repeat, all mechanical aids must be regarded merely as aids which have become useful for us on account of our weakness. Let us not put our hope either in them or in the quantity of our work, lest we be robbed of our hope in the Lord, and yet prove that we put our trust essentially in ourselves or in something vain or material. Let us not seek pleasure or visions. We are sinners, unworthy of spiritual pleasures and visions, unfit for them on account of our decrepitude. By attentive prayer, let us seek to turn the gaze of our mind to ourselves, so that we may discover within ourselves our sinfulness. When we discover it, let us stand mentally before our Lord Jesus Christ, in the company of the lepers, the blind, the deaf, the lame, the paralyzed, the possessed, and let us begin our mournful cry of prayer before him from the poverty of our spirit and from a heart crushed with sorrow for our sinfulness. Let this cry be infinitely abundant. Let all prolixity and all variety of words prove unfit to express it. On account of its abundance and inexpressibility, let it be clothed continually. Let it be clothed in the brief but meaningful prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen.